Euh, attends. Record local oh. files. Ok. Gerade hinsetzen hier. I gotta speak English. I don't know if I can speak English right now. My brain is so tired. It was weird for me to speak so much German yesterday because my life here is mostly in English. Did you get that? I'm so As if you understand the Bahnhof. You only understand train station? It's all Greek to me. Understanding train station. Living between cultures with Josh and Feli. Welcome back to a new episode of Understanding Train Station. I'm Feli, and I also wanted to say Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes, <laughs> but Merry <maybe> Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and happy holidays, because this is coming out on um, the day before Christmas Eve, which to Germans means like the day before Christmas, because basically we, when we say Weihnachten, Christmas, we refer to the 24th of December. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I hope everyone's having a good time. A starre Zeit in Bavarian dialect. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard that before? I ha A starre Zeit. Stade with, an, with a D. A starre no, mm -hmm. what does you know that mean? That means? It means like the quiet, like ruhige Zeit, stille Zeit, uh, something like okay. that. No, I don't know the word Stad. So. Yeah, well, now you do. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My brain is so, actually, I feel like, more in, in Spanish mode than it has been in German mode lately. That um, makes sense. I think I mentioned this in the last podcast, right? But that I, I'm now in Cincinnati, and that's why if you're watching on YouTube... Um, we've kind of switched roles. I'm in Cincinnati now visiting family, and Feli is in Munich um, yes. visiting her family and working. <laughs> yeah. um, but both staying busy. But before I came to Cincinnati, I was in Mexico for a week with some friends. So Super if you're watching exciting. on YouTube as well, you can see I'm wearing what's called, there are a couple different names for it in, in Spanish. I call it a jerga. It's also like a suéter de franela. Um, but in English, I, we have a funny nickname for it, at least in the U.S. Um, I know growing up, a lot of people called them drug rugs. <laughs> really? Okay, I've never yeah. heard that before. Yeah, okay. it was always like the stoners in school who would wear them. Oh, okay. I was going to ask, like, is it because like Mexicans are no, like the Mexican cliche of like having drug dealers and stuff like that? Or... I'm sure there's a like, connection to it. But like I said, yeah. I just know like growing up in high school... Um, most of the people that would wear wear the herga would be the stoners in school. So I like when I bought it, I had it at in the back of my mind. Like I wonder how people would perceive me if I'm wearing it. But mm -hmm. I bought it in Mexico when I was with my Mexican friends. So I it's really comfortable too. So perfect for the winter weather. Although it's not particularly cold here right now. How long, it was pretty warm when I left. Is it still around like 15 degrees Celsius? No, it's colder than that now. Oh, it's okay. colder than that. Yeah. But, um, but it was a, it was a rough transition going from twenty six degrees Celsius to oh. like I think it's like maybe five. Okay, yeah, I bet. I mean, I want to hear all about your Mexican trip, and I'm sure everyone else wants to hear about it too. I have a question about the the drug rug. Is there like another English <laughs> <laughs> term? What's it called again? Herga uh, or herga. Okay, that's the easiest thing to say, but that's confusing because it's also the word for slang. Okay, it has multiple meanings. So, your sweater, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, what kind of image does it have in Mexico? Do you know? Is it mm. more like a super traditional or is it just a everyday kind of piece of clothing? I think it's more of an everyday piece of clothing. I don't okay. really know specifically though. So, if you, there are any Mexicans who are listening to the podcast, Samer, if you're listening, uh, let us know in the, in the comments. Samer is my friend that we've interviewed on the podcast before. Um, and who I went to Mexico with. So if you have that answer, let me know. But um, I mean, there were like people out in public wearing this too with their families. So okay. I think it's more of, um, I mean, it is definitely like more of a Mexican traditional look or traditional piece of clothing. But mm -hmm. as far as any connotations or stereotypes that are associated with people who wear them, I'm I'm not sure. I'm unaware. Okay. Okay. Well, so how was your trip? It was awesome. It was so much fun. Um I, it was my first time in Mexico, um, mm -hmm. and we arrived in Mexico City, which is huge. And we went straight from the airport to get tacos, and I was so happy. Nice. <laughs> um, there's like a street near Mexico City, or <laughs> near Mexico City. There's a street in Mexico City right next to the airport um, mm -hmm. where you can get tacos. There's actually a Netflix series called The Taco Chronicles where they go to it. It's the episode about tacos al pastor. Okay. Um, so we went and got some of the tacos that they show in the, um, Netflix show. So that was really cool. Nice. I had a tongue taco. Um, but 
Yeah, it was a, a taco. Tongue taco. Yeah, a cow tongue taco. Mmm, yummy. <laughs> If you want, I can post it on Instagram for the uh, yeah, for no, people sure, to see. <laughs> I'm sure people are interested in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we also had um, crickets. Not not tacos made of crickets, but that's just like uh, they're called chapulines. Just um, like as a snack. No, there's a thing called a sope, which is like a corn tortilla, if you will, but it's mm -hmm. like a corn base made out of dough. And then you put like a sauce on it. So be it um, beans or whatever you may want as a base. And then they, I think they had guacamole and then they had um, the crickets on top of it. If you okay. don't think about the fact that you're eating crickets, it's actually really good and tasty. That's what people always say when they try crickets. That yeah. it's like you, you can't really tell. Like it just tastes kind of salty, I think is what yeah, people Yeah, it's salty and say. crunchy. Yeah. But it was cool. So we went to Mexico City, did some sightseeing there. Um, then we went to the pyramids of Teotihuacan, which are near Mexico City, which is the Aztec py uh, pyramids, where I got sunburnt. But then after the pyramids, we went to eat in a place that was a cave. Um, so you go down into the cave and it's this restaurant, um, which was really, really cool. And they pr serve pre-Hispanic food. So the food that was eaten in Mexico before the Spanish arrived, or at mm -hmm. least that's the way they they sell it, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, how authentic it truly was and how true they were to that, I'm not sure. Um, but it was really, really good. And then I went to... What was it? It's mostly just traditional Mexican food as well. Um, oh, okay. So beans, like black beans, um, mole. Um, they had a tamal or a tamale, like we say in English. Mm -hmm. um, what else was there? There was like um, a fried tortilla roll. Um And some, okay, so not some like beef. completely different than no, what no. you would think of. Okay. No, I mean it was still very Mexican, but they use at least they used ingredients that didn't exist uh, or that existed in Mexico prior to mm -hmm. um, the Spanish invasion. Okay. So, so that was kind of cool. Um, the restaurant is called La Gruta, which means the the cave. So, mm -hmm. if you uh, are Grotte. interested in checking it out, yeah. Wait, how do you say it? Grotte. Grotte. Mm -hmm. It means cave. Yeah, it's like a it's like a different kind of cave. Yeah, uh, we also have Höhle, but Grotte. Yeah. Hmm, now it's it's always hard to define words. I want to say a Grotte is usually, uh, hmm, I, usually like by water. I think. Uh, okay. Maybe not. For some reason, you like you use those words in different contexts. Yeah, yeah. In Spanish, there are two words as well. There's mm -hmm. la gruta, and there's also caverna. Um, Maybe a Grotte is. Bigger. I'm not quite sure. Germans, let me know in the comments below. I could look it up right now, but yeah. I'm sure there is a clear definition as to when you use which word. But yeah, Grotte is a German word as well. Yeah, yeah. No, so that was really cool. Then we continued on to a city called San Miguel de Allende, which is a little bit more of a touristy town, um, but really quaint. There are a lot of Americans that move there to retire because it's so cheap um, compared to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then we continued on to Guanajuato, which is the capital of the state of Guanajuato, which was beautiful. I think that was my favorite city. Okay. Um, and then at, from there we went to Querétaro, which is, it's all a little north of, uh, it's central Mexico, but north of Mexico city. And then mm -hmm. went back to Mexico city to fly to, to the U.S. So it was a really, okay. really fun trip. Um, the really fly thankful with that you? I was able to do it. No, he actually continued on to um, visit family for his son's baptism. Oh. So, yeah. That's cool. And you yeah, flew into so Mexico good. directly from Munich. So, like, I could see how, first of all, you were very happy with the weather and mm -hmm. then also the Mexican food, too. Because yes. you don't really get a lot of that in Munich. <laughs> exactly. It was like complete a complete culture change going from mm -hmm. Germany, where, I mean, I like German food, don't get me wrong, but. It's not as flavorful as Mexican food mm -hmm. um, or spicy. And then also getting to walk around in a t-shirt again was pretty great. Mm -hmm. So just that quick, <laughs> the, the change was uh, was interesting. And then I had a little bit of reverse culture shock coming to the U.S. Um, afterwards. From Mexico or from Germany? From both. Just having oh, okay. not been in the U.S. for five months. Um, just random people talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, I was at the airport and they were showing a game and people were asking me about sports. I was like, okay. I don't care. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to carry those conversations. And I just was overwhelmed because there were strangers asking me these mm -hmm. questions. But I mean, you get used to it pretty quickly. Yeah, that that is a culture shock. I'm like, usually now the other way around, I'm never really culture shocked anymore when I go back to the US. But when I come back to Germany, I always realize how polite I've become. So I went to the doctors yesterday. 
And it's just like the way that I say like, thank you so much. And like, especially at German doctor's offices, they're usually not very nice. Mm -hmm. These people at the, I went to two different um, practices and both front desk people were actually friendly for German standards. But mm -hmm. even for them, it's like, you know, they give me like this pen to fill out a form and I give it back to them and like accidentally drop it or something. They're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And then they're like, oh, macht nichts. It's, yeah. and they just have this like super straight voice like, yes, it's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they don't mean anything by it. That's just normal for them. Yeah. And I'm all like, hi, um, blah, blah, like all friendly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you feel like a little kid, like, hey, I'm yeah. here. Will you help yeah, me? And, and afterwards, it's like, schönen Tag noch, frohe Weihnachten, tschüss. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, ihn auch, tschüss. It's just, just like a different... Just very short responses. <laughs> yeah. And I never realized that, um, this is like one of the first times that I really realized that I've actually gotten more polite, which... Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing because I don't think I was raised that way because my my parents are very direct and mm -hmm. I mean they'll they're just like every other German they're polite yeah, they're enough, not rude they're just yeah but yeah not just overly direct. polite they don't have to say have have to wish everyone happy holidays or say thank you and please all the time or say I'm sorry all the time yeah. um, so yeah that's my little story about reverse culture shock. I think that's yeah, I mean, a good it's thing, not even like really like shocks. You're just like, oh, this is interesting. You know? Yeah, I realize it because the other person doesn't say it back. Yeah, that's how I like. I realize that I've changed in the interaction with other people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I guess. Oh, also, what did I do? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so I've been. There's two little things that also showed me how I've become Americanized. Um, I've been editing this video um, that at this point. Is hopefully already up on my channel. If not, <laughs> then um, I'm working on it. Um, I went to Chicago to kind of discover the German roots of Chicago about a month ago in collaboration with the German Embassy and the German American Heritage Foundation. And I interviewed the Consul General in Chicago, who is a German, but we did the interview in English. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked about this before in a video, how to a German, or at least in my understanding, it can come off kind of weird um, when Americans just say mm-hmm or yeah as a response to thank you. Mm -hmm. And I did that in that interview and I didn't realize it until I edited it later on. And I was like, wow, I really, I hope that Americans pick this up as normal and I hope that Germans don't pick this up as rude because I was like really exhausted. Um, I Like we drove all day to Chicago and then like set up all the cameras and stuff like that. I sat down for the interview. We didn't have a lot of time. He was like mm -hmm. in a time rush, the consul was, because he had to go to, an, uh, like he had to leave town. And so I was sitting down and like I started the interview and I was like, thank you so much for having me. And he said, thank you for mu so much for being here. And I said, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it just, it sounds a little bit like I'm saying like, yeah, you better be thankful that I'm here, which like, was not at all what I meant in that situation. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't realize I did that, especially with other Germans, because he mm -hmm. is a German. So like I was kind of shocked by myself. And then the other day, I was with a friend here in Germany and I was talking to someone in the US on the phone and I hung up the phone and I, like the conversation was all nice, you know? Yeah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Okay, have a good night. Okay, bye. And I've made fun of that before with Americans, but I now do that too with other Americans, like how once you say bye, it sounds kind of short and rude compared uh -huh. to the rest of the conversation. And my friend, like, I didn't even realize it anymore that I do that. And my friend was like, what just happened? Like, <laughs> she laughed at me. I was like, oh yeah, oopsie. Yeah, I totally forgot that you probably wouldn't expect this. Yeah, Americans kind of do that. And so if yeah, once you're done with the conversation, it, it's done. There's no reason to drag it out. That's how we do it. <laughs> but it's, it's still weird to me, even though mm -hmm. I do it myself now. It's like, Especially if it's like people, I think we talked about this recently in the podcast too, like parents or something talking to each other and saying like, okay, love you or see mm -hmm. you soon, have a good night. Okay, bye. And then I just, I don't <laughs> understand how it goes from that to like, bye, okay, or bye. like, bye bye. Um, uh, whereas in German, it would be like, okay, schönen Tag noch, okay, tschüss. <laughs> like yeah, it stays friendly. singing at the end. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was funny when I was uh, in Mexico with Samer, we were. Uh, I mean, we were speaking Spanish with each other most of the time. Every once in a while, especially when negotiating prices on souvenirs, uh, we would speak mm -hmm. with each other in German. Um, because? Just because, just because, to, just to make sure that the vendors weren't taking care, uh, advantage of the fact oh, that okay. I'm Oh, okay, so not if Mexican. you were like 
trying so, so he, that nobody could So he would help me negotiate you. and I'd be mm-hmm. like to him in German, hey, what do you think about this price or should I offer this much or this much or what do you think? Um, but so there was a little German throughout the vacation as well. And at some point he he brought up the point and I thought it was hilarious that the Germans always say, yeah, wir sollten jetzt langsam gehen. Like we should get out of like what's up with the langsam? Like we should we should slowly head out of here. Like Yeah. It, <laughs> it, just, it, means, it sounds it, really it funny. Like, it doesn't it doesn't mean slowly, but it's just like no. a way of like starting initiating the fact that you're thinking of leaving now. Yeah. Uh but it's just funny that the Germans always say that. I hadn't thought of it's that like in the past. It's like we should but. get going, I guess, or like yeah. in that case langsam could be translated to um demnächst. So like in the near future we should exactly. probably Get going, yeah. Yeah, it's just as funny though. Like, if you take the word by word translation, it's we should leave slowly now. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about that before. <laughs> yeah, so that was a, oh, a funny experience too that he thought was funny. Yeah. But. So uh, I wanted to ask, or for both of us to talk a little bit about our travel experiences, just like getting from one country mm-hmm. to the other. And you even you had two kind of longer yeah. flights from Germany to Mexico and then Mexico back to the U.S. Did you have any? Any trouble getting it was into so a country? Simple. Okay. It was so simple. Um, I flew to Mexico from Amsterdam, so that was actually the longest flight I've ever been on. It was like 12 hours. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm used to when you hit North America, so hit Canada coming from Europe, I'm like, okay, I'm almost home, no big mm-hmm. deal. But this time I still had like a third of the trip ahead of me. So I, you'd like fly over Atlanta and then across the Gulf of Mexico and then mm-hmm. land relatively close to uh, Mexico City then, or mm-hmm. hit land close to Mexico City. Um, so that was like a long flight. But as far as um, the experience itself, it was really simple. One interesting okay. thing is when you get to Mexico as a tourist, you get a little card. Um, that you have to fill out mm-hmm. um, with your contact information. And they ask you when you're passing through immigration how long you're going to be in the country. And they write it on the little card and you have to keep the card with you. Um, and then when you leave the country, you give the card um, to the airline. And I think the airline then has to report the fact that you leave. So you get an entry stamp, but you don't get an exit stamp. Um, so was that a COVID measurement or just a regular mm-hmm. travel? I think that's okay. I think that's normal. I was reading on some forums that it's okay. always that way. And now that I'm thinking about it, when um, I went to Peru in high school, it was very similar. I don't know if we got an exit stamp, but I remember having a card and we were told, whatever you do, do not lose this card because it's very important. So I actually got a card like that when I traveled to the U.S. once. Um, oh, yeah? I don't remember if, yeah. And I, it was when my family and I uh, entered the U.S., by land from Canada. So hmm. maybe that's why we got it. I'm not quite sure because I've never gotten it after that. And I have actually done the same thing later on in my life. And I don't think I ever got a card like that ever again. So I'm not quite sure mm-hmm. what that was about. But I do remember I was like, how old was I? Uh, 20, I think, at the time. Um, so it's been a few years that we all got a card like that. And it was also the same thing, like you, you're supposed to keep it in your passport. And then when you leave, you're supposed to give it to someone. I don't even remember where we, who, yeah. who we gave it to. But, so that was weird. Yeah. But um, I say weird because it just was something I wasn't used to. Yeah. Um, but then the travel to the U.S. from Mexico was also very simple. Um, it was my first time using Global Entry, which was really nice. Oh, yeah. I got to skip, skip the line completely. Um, you just go... And I went to the little kiosk and you take a picture of yourself and you get a printout. And then I just had to give it to a border agent. They didn't ask any questions. You just handed it to them. And then I just walked into the country, uh, which was pretty weird. It was a weird experience because I'm used to having to at least have them check my passport and all of this. But they have all my biometrics. um, Mm -hmm. So they know what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was really, really smooth. And travel to Cincinnati was fine, too. Just got back like right around uh, 11 at night, um, which is late for me and very late for my parents who picked me up from the airport, mm-hmm. but they were happy to do it. So um, yeah, it was a relatively smooth travel experience. How was yours? Nice. Um, mine was smooth as well, except for one little exception that it wasn't like about the travel itself. It was more like before traveling. And I don't know what's up with airlines recently because I, I had that same problem last time I flew back from Munich to Cincinnati and I've heard about other people having that same problem now. Um, and it's just like seat selection. I don't know what's up. So mm-hmm. this flight was with yeah. United and then operated by Lufthansa. And for some reason, like I couldn't book a 
seat in advance, not even if I wanted to pay for it. Like, it was just mm. not available online, even though, like, the United, um, like, portal platform portal is actually really good. And the Lufthansa one is, like, nice enough. And mm -hmm. it just didn't work. And then it's, but it did say, like, oh, you, if the option isn't available, then you'll be able to pick a seat during check-in. And like to me, on a long flight, it's kind of important to have a seat that I like, which to, for me is always at the window. Yeah. Um, and then during checkout, that didn't work. And during checkout, it just said, on United, it said, um, you're going to have to go to Lufthansa to pick your seat. On Lufthansa, it said, oh, you're going to have to uh, go to United to check in. And then I called both customer services and both of them were like oh yeah no you're gonna have to go to Lufthansa oh yeah no you're gonna have to contact United about that so never ending loop nobody had access to the stupid seating plan which was really frustrating so I didn't yeah. actually get to pick my seat well they like assigned me a random one which was like I think in the middle row the middle mm -hmm. seat which is like great <laughs> thank you for nothing so, so um, you were in the middle the middle no, seat no 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 but they told me that I would I was able to Maybe if there's one available, pick a seat at the gate. So okay. like I had to wait until I flew from Cincinnati to Chicago and then at the gate in Chicago, once people were actually at the counter, I was able to finally ask. And then they did have a window seat for me. And I was actually lucky because the window seat that they had for me was at the very back of the plane, like uh, second to last row. Mm -hmm. And nobody else was there. So I had a whole uh, row to myself. So was, that it a, was, nice. was it three seats wide or was it just two seats three. wide? Three. Oh, so that's the best. I've only had that out. once. <laughs> But I, that was the best flight I've ever had because you just sleep awesome. the entire time. Yeah, that's or what I, I did. I, I slept through both meals because I have been working really? so much recently and I haven't slept a lot. The dinner, okay, so I got on the plane and I was really, really tired, right? And I was like, okay, this is going to be the most sleep I'm going to get, like that I've, I've been getting in a while because mm -hmm. I really hadn't been sleeping a lot. So, But I was like, I'm really hungry, so I'm going to stay up until they serve dinner and then go to sleep right after. And I see them yeah. like already rolling the carts through the plane. I'm like, okay, okay, I can make it till then. I didn't make it for so I don't know Zonked how it out. happened. I didn't make it. I wake up like a little later when they come by with the drinks, and I was like, "Oh, cool! They're just starting to give out the drinks." But no, it was already the after was the, the meal second, drink. Yeah. Round. yeah, and so luckily they like noticed that I was sleeping, and they were like, "Hey, would you like your dinner?" I was like, "Oh, did I did I miss it?" So they gave me dinner, <laughs> but then breakfast I slept through that completely. So. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> um, that's more important to get the sleep than the the breakfast, and then that makes the jet lag not as bad. Yeah, I'm not jet lagged at all because I haven't had a sleeping rhythm recently, so my body yeah. didn't even know when day and night was, anyways. So yeah. yeah, I haven't been jet lagged, but no, my travel experience other than that was good. Right now, entering Germany, all you have to show is your vaccination proof. Mm -hmm. um, so I just showed my CDC card like I did in the summer, and mm -hmm. that was fine. No and then I actually was able to get my EU certificate, my oh, vaccination good. certificate, which is digital here yeah. uh, for all American listeners and viewers um and i just i could go into a apotheca so a german pharmacy and they just transferred it for me so that's, i now have so my nice. digital certificate which is nice because right now in germany you have to show that every time you enter a store for example or other yeah. places pretty Except much anything for besides gro yeah i was gonna say besides yeah. grocery stores and i don't know there was a big discussion for a while if uh bookstores should be considered essential stores or not yeah, I saw Are that they? in the news. What? Are they now or no? I don't know. They're not. I don't know. Right? I just I that just made me giggle when I saw the headline. I was like, yeah. hm. okay, interesting. <laughs> I mean, I know that Germans like to read, and there are at least where I live in Munich, a lot of bookstores. Um, I'm thinking maybe they just they're considering what if someone doesn't have access to the internet or something and needs yeah. information, maybe like in that sense or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Who oh knows? well. <laughs> but so today we'll actually stick with that whole topic of like from country to country because we were able to talk again to our friend Niklas, who is mm -hmm. now already back in Germany, but we talked to him before he moved back. Um, we interviewed him about a year ago um, about mostly just work culture because he has a lot of experience with working both in the U.S. and in Germany. Um, he was sent over through his job. So that's how he like knows a lot of things. He's hired people before. So that was really interesting last year. If you haven't listened to that yet or watched it, definitely check it out. I'm going to link it somewhere. Um, and yeah, so we were able to talk to him again right before he moved back to Germany about that, that topic, but also a few other topics because he's also mm -hmm. from the northern part of Germany. So there's a few cultural differences there between where I am from and where you live compared to where mm -hmm. he's from. So um 
that was really interesting. But before we go into that interview, of course, we want to tell you one last time for this year that we have a special offer for you. If you want to learn a second language with Lingoda, um, you can get 40% off right now if you click on the link in the show notes or um, in the video description on YouTube. Which I think is funny. We talk about this a lot of the fact that I'm learning French as well. But Lingoda offers more than just French, uh, just for all yeah. of you who know <laughs> that. Um, they offer English, business English, which is a great advantage if you um, need English for your work and just want to make sure that you um, are aware of cultural differences and also just have the vocabulary that you need to communicate well um, in an English speaking environment in the work culture. Um, they have Spanish, French, and German, I believe. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, German is obviously the best pick. <laughs> they're actually a German company, so they're located exactly. in that's Berlin. Exactly. That was the whole point I was going to say is we talk oh, yeah. about <laughs> the French part of it all, all the time, but they're actually a German company um, based in Berlin. I can speak from my personal experience with my French classes that I've learned a lot from being able to join um, and also the fact that they have native teachers or native speakers as their teachers. So you get that insight into the way that people truly speak, um, some cultural insights, and you can really get to work on your pronunciation well then because you have the perfect example in front of you in your class. Another great benefit that they have is that they have classes available 24-7. So no matter where you are in the world, you'll always be able to find a class. Yeah, so it's online in case we haven't mentioned that yet. <laughs> but I think that was probably clear. So it's like a Zoom class where you sit down, but you also get um, materials provided, right? Like mm -hmm. you, I mean, I haven't yep. taken a class with them in a while, but it's like you look at a PDF or something mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. So um, it's an online class, but it's almost like you're together in person. So, like, exactly. a, a really nice mix. And the teachers are really good about making sure that everyone gets an opportunity to, to speak and are a little pushed in each class too. So in your class, you're never going to have more than five other students or five students in total. Um, so the teacher is really able to focus on each individual, uh, make sure that they're getting the information, making sure they understand and have opportunities to speak. And another cool thing that they do is after the class, you get a class report where your teacher can then give you comments on what you did well and areas that you can work on um, so getting that feedback while you're learning is very important as well. And Lingoda does a great job of providing that. Awesome. Well, um, are you going to keep learning French in the new year? I will. I will. Okay. I most certainly will, especially since <laughs> we'll see with COVID and everything, but I have a trip planned to Paris. Um, so I'll be able to hopefully use it soon. Do you know when yet? In March. Okay. Well, hopefully that's going to be possible. Um, that would be yes. cool. Well, you just went to France recently too, to Strasbourg. Yeah. How do you say it in English again? Stras Strasbourg. <laughs> Strasbourg. I can't like get to the front. I can't get used to the pronunciation. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So for all of you also who maybe have New Year's resolutions or who just want to continue learning a new language in 2022 as well, um, you can now use our discount, which is 40% off. Which that's almost half the price off, so yeah. pretty good deal, on the marathon classes or the first month of your monthly subscription. So just click the link down below and enjoy the discount. And now off to the interview with Niklas. Niklas, welcome back. How Thank are you? you? Thanks for having me. I'm good, I'm good. It's, it's Friday after Thanksgiving. I'm very full of food. I had turkey twice yesterday, so I skipped nice. breakfast and I'm still full. Nice. Black Friday, technically, but we're just uh, chilling true. at home. Yeah, do you, are you guys Friday, planning on going shopping at all today? I saw a few people standing in line yesterday at a GameStop. I was very surprised by that. I'm not sure what they want there, but they were definitely <laughs> camping. It was like noon yesterday. Um, That's crazy. I might go to the mall, check it out, yeah. see what, mm -hmm. what they got, but nothing special. I was going to say, it's most from, of the good deals are gone now, probably, if it's, it's too late that, and for, for me, Thanksgiving Black Friday is just a nice time off, especially with work. This week, nobody was working at all. I yeah. got like no responses, only out of the office messages. So it's a good week to catch up and just, just relax. Yeah, nice. And for those of you who don't know who Niklas is, we actually talked to him on our podcast a little over a year ago. Was it? I think it was back in October or something. I think it was like exactly a year ago. Yeah, you were one of our first guests or our I think he was our first guest. guest. I think it yeah. was the first one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like it's an honor to have you back and a lot of people loved you. For those of you who like didn't listen to the episode, first of all, go back and listen, of course. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but Nicholas is a friend of ours in Cincinnati and a year ago when Josh still lived in Cincinnati. <laughs> um, we actually hung out a lot, the three of us, and um, and together with Nicholas's wife. We also went, went on vacation together last year. Well, actually, a couple times. Yeah, um, we went on a few before Josh left us. Yeah, yeah before yeah. I decided to... Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> I was going to say something bad. They're, my what? roommates, my roommates are such a bad influence. Like I used to never curse as, or cuss as much as I do now. I was about to say, yeah, before I decided to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. No, I don't. I, want, I, d- I don't want that in the. <laughs> the I don't want the, my parents to hear that. <laughs> this is the internet. It's a wild place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was oh, before yeah. I decided to move. Yeah, I think which I is funny too because. I, in preparation for this episode, I was listening to our previous uh, conversation with you, Niklas, and it was in that episode that I announced that I was moving to Germany. Which That's is pretty crazy. crazy. Yeah, Listen, yeah, but, but the, yeah, the comments were really nice. I read probably most of them. It was my hobby for a week just to update the comments <laughs> and read through them. So it's good that they're mostly positive. I think there was a few discussion points, but nothing like, hey, Niklas, never come on this podcast again. <laughs> no, they were all like, Niklas needs to be a permanent part of this podcast. They all loved you. Yes. And what we mainly talked about last time was like office culture, work culture, because you, Niklas, came to the US, to Cincinnati to work. Um, and you also have people employed. You have um, employees. Oh, that was a weird way of saying that. <laughs> um and so, yeah, we talked a lot about those things that we hadn't really addressed in any previous podcasts. And I think we haven't really, really talked about it a lot since, but there were a lot of follow-up questions, comments. Um, so I figured maybe we'll just talk about that first a little bit um, to kind of address the comments from the last episode. It's, it's really great to have you back, Niklas, too, because uh-huh. we talked about it last year. We were like, yeah, we're going to have you back soon. And yeah, sure, sure. Now it's a year later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we weren't lying. Yeah. It just sometimes we're a little slow. No, in, we're uh, not lying. <laughs> We've been busy with and, other topics. Yeah, and this time, of course, we're not together in person, but via Zoom. Even though Niklas and I are in the same city, but... Yeah, we're not that far from each other. <laughs> no, but it's just easier because Josh isn't here to kind it's of It's so weird, it though, way. just... I'm still not used to you guys both being in Cincinnati and me being in Germany. It's just like, it's not the way <laughs> the world is meant to be. Not for long, though. <laughs> <laughs> because Niklas is actually moving back to Germany, but we'll talk about that in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, if if... if Josh is coming here for Christmas. I'm back in Germany, and you maybe go home for Christmas. Well, we're switching just yeah. yes. countries again. Everything will be right in the world again. <laughs> Everything yes. will be right. The Germans back in Germany, and the Americans <laughs> in the U.S. Yes, except Nicholas will be all the way in the north, and we will be all the way in the south. Yeah. Oh, there's so many good segues that you're using right now for us to get into topics, but <laughs> we have an order that we're sticking to. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's um, talk about the comments from the last episode first, or the all the topics that we wanted to kind of address a little bit. So in our last episode, we talked a little bit about Probezeit. Um, and I mean, so that, I guess that's a probationary period would be the English translation. And someone wrote in the comments, in Germany, we have Probezeit, so you can fire someone at any point within the first three months of their employment without any reason. Also the other way around, you can leave the company at any time in that period of time without any reason. So if you got a bad employee, you can get rid of him in Germany. You just shouldn't wait until the first three months of their first day at the company are over. So I guess it's the main topic I think that we were talking about was um, hiring and firing practices in the U.S. and Germany. And I think we forgot a bit to talk about probicide or trial period or whatever Mm -hmm. you want to call it. And I, I read up about it. I talked to our HR people, and it's three to six months. And as I said, as, as the comment said, you can either be fired or released, whatever you call it, or quit your job within that, that time period. And the other special thing is in that time period, you're officially not allowed to take vacation. That's what I also found ah. out because we're moving back to Germany. My wife is switching jobs. She has trial period. We want to come back to the U.S. in like April. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, I'm in my trial period. I can't take vacation days. I was like, I'm which is like six months without vacation as a German is a long time. Yeah, you know, we, we need true. our I've, vacation. I've heard about that before, though. Like a lot of my friends, when they first start a job, I, did, I never knew if that was like a rule or if it was just like a common practice that during your trial period, you'd rather not request vacation days because that kind of sends a wrong message or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's more like that. It's like, hey, you mm-hmm. shouldn't. And I feel like people are cool about it now. So if you talk to your company and say, hey, I have a vacation plan because... I booked it a year ago before I started this job. Can I have two weeks off like when I'm three months in? That's not a problem at all. You probably shouldn't start a week and then go on a two-week vacation, mm-hmm. come back for three weeks and then go on vacation again. But yeah, yeah. it's more like, I'm not sure if it's an official rule or more an unwritten rule, but that's what I always learned. Like, hey, don't take vacation in your, in your trial period. At least from my experience, I would agree that it's probably more of a unwritten rule, but just the best practices. Um, I've never seen anything written down in any of the the clauses that I've seen in my contracts regarding not taking vacation, but I definitely have heard people like trying to avoid it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that I, I saw is like you can get like a, you have the trial period as a full time employee, but also if you're a trainee, you also get a trial period. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when I was a trainee, after six months, my my HR person came to me and said, "Hey, Nicholas, you're done with the trial period. Like, congrats!" Like, I was like, "Oh, I was on the trial period. I didn't even know that. <laughs> you didn't know. I was, like, okay. I was at risk the whole time. <laughs> I, I think it's more like a legal thing that they have to do. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, you get for us. It was always six months in the company that I I work with. And honestly, we have used it in the, in the past year a few times. And uh, we've used it, and employees have used it to like say, "Hey, it's not working. This is not the right fit, especially yeah. with." not having in-person interviews with mm-hmm. only doing Zoom calls or Teams calls or whatever, you sometimes get a wrong impression of the company. So it's good if you have the easy way out. So is that a thing in the U.S. as well? Or is that a um, special thing for German work? It, I've not seen it here in the U.S. I mean, um, not only here, you just put in your two weeks notice and you're good yeah. to go. But yeah. we had a few employees where we said, hey, if, if they want to leave or we want to say, hey, it, it's not working out anymore and they're here for a longer time, you need to have more reasoning. You have to have some kind of cause to actually, mm-hmm. you cannot just say, hey, you don't work anymore. You can probably come up with like either financial reasons for the company or personal reasons or non-performance, but it needs to be documented in some kind of way. It's not that mm-hmm. you, it's not that my company could come in Monday morning and say, hey, Nicholas, you're fired. It's not that easy. It's easier yeah. than Germany, but not that easy. Yeah, but so the people that you just talked about where you said you used the probation period in the last year, um, were, were those German contracts? Or yeah, American German contracts. contracts. We had okay. had some people that started with us and after a few months we said, hey, this is not working out. Or the person okay. said, hey, this is not working out for me either. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was just confused with that. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. what, go, ahead. go ahead, Josh. I just was going to say it's nice to have the both way like ability there that... At, in those three months, it's the same from both sides that you each can decide that it doesn't work for you or three or six months or whatever the mm-hmm. length of the probationary period is. Like in my case, it was three months and I've mm-hmm. most people I know have three months. I One of my roommates actually though, it was a little funky the way that he started. He was living in Portugal but started working at this company and the plan was for him to move to Germany but he was still living in, in Portugal working. And he was on his probationary period for three months in Portugal, and then he finally moved to Germany, and then he's on a probationary period for another six months. So altogether, for the same job, he's been, or he will have a probationary period of nine months. Oh, gosh. He he seems to be a risky risky character. (laughs) No, but I I said, especially now, I mean, we're hiring a lot of people because it's, it's a good economy for the business that we do. But first of all, it's very, very hard to get people. Mm-hmm. And if you're an employee right now, you can ask for whatever. So I think you can literally go out right now and say, hey, I don't want a probation period. But it also protects yourself a bit. So yeah. depending on, on what you want. Cool. I think that's uh, all we have to say on that topic of uh, I think probation we, 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 correct, we corrected ourselves there. <laughs> we didn't correct. We against. Added. Yeah. <laughs> against. Yeah. <laughs> We allowed we added something. We have we have to teach Josh the, the English language again. <laughs> <laughs> it was so horrible when I was listening to the last um, last episode that we had together too. I was like, Josh, you sound like such a pretentious fool because like I, I asked you guys, how do you say Gesprächspartner in in English? <laughs> like, it just is a and that it's was more before laziness. You moved to Germany. Yes, and that was before I moved to Germany. So, uh. so another question was like a follow up question. Do small business owners in Germany leave work for six weeks each year like employees do? What about farmers? And this is because we talked about how Germans usually have like 26 to 30 vacation days, even when they first start out in their jobs. And I think to Americans, that's just a very foreign concept. So there are a few questions about that. Um, and I'm not quite sure if I can answer that. So on farmers, I can actually answer it. Because <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think Niklas can answer the farmer that, that, question. That, that's where I'm good at. So no, <laughs> yeah. I, was, I, was, I was home in Germany last week and, and my best friend is a farmer. Yeah. And I went there and it was him and, and his girlfriend and we were sitting in their new house and they were building a bigger farm because they were investing. First of all, farming has nothing to do anymore with what I'm used to. It's like a like a science. So everything goes over Excel yeah. sheets and like data and all this stuff. But we talked about it because it was me, him and then some other friend and, and his girlfriend. And we talked about going on vacation somewhere next year, Italy or so. And we asked him like how he's doing it. He says like, my parents are taking over if I leave. But the maximum I can do is really like a long weekend because yeah. they have to be up at well, probably like 4.30, 4.30 yeah. to like 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. They have to be out there, get the milk, all the stuff. Then they have work to do. It's an everyday job and yeah. it's very, very hard. So if he has the support from his family, like his parents live next door 
um, but they're in their early 60s now or late 50s, mm-hmm. they can still do it. But if you don't have your parents next door who can jump in, you can simply not go on, on vacation. It, it's not possible. He visited me here three years ago, but that was before he took over. He said mm-hmm. this would not be possible right now. It's, it's just a full-time job. So no, farmers do not take vacation. It's, it's as simple like that. They, they do like it's a, a week hard here. Life. It's I mean, people, you really have to love the job to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very rewarding, I think, because you, you do everything for yourself, especially if you work on, on a smaller farm. But yeah, I, it would be nothing for me. Especially you had, okay, no vacation you, or just like week-long vacation I can work with, but no weekends off every single yeah. day. Yeah. Like, hey, your friends want to go out on a Saturday evening? Yes, I can do it. But 4.30 a.m., I'm standing on my farm working. Yeah, yeah and you not just like, get home and just work right away, basically. Don't if I have to sleep. work the next morning after going out, I, I put on my sweatshirt and just sit at my desk and like relax. No, it's, yeah. it's physical work. And yeah. Yeah. not just in the summer, also in the winter. And, you know, German winters are not that nice. So all the stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I have a lot of, lot of respect for people who do it. And yeah, I think uh, small business owners, people who are self-employed, they just have to be ready not getting paid. Money. For yeah. like the time they take vacation, they can definitely take the vacation, but they don't do it. And then also, if they have employees, let's say you're a small business owner, you have two employees, and they have their vacation days, which they have, you have to pay salary for that period, mm-hmm. while these employees are not bringing in any revenue. If you like, yeah. say you have a plumbing business, and your your main plumber takes off a whole month, you have to pay him, but you're not getting any revenue in. So it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, it definitely depends on what kind of business you're in. If it's something where you make a lot of money during the times when you're open, or yeah, it really kind of depends on what you are, um, then I think it's definitely possible and normal. And for example, with like small shops or restaurants or something, I think in Germany you definitely see signs like, we're on vacation until blah, blah, blah. Like a little yeah. sign in the, in the door. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have to plan ahead for sure. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I think it's, it's it's very seasonal, and you can probably not go on vacation whenever you want. Yeah, all these things. Yeah, but I would say the, all of those things are still true for the United States as well. I mean, when it comes to small businesses and farming, it's kind of a one man show, and unless you have support from um, from family members, like you said, Nicholas, I think I think you really can't take vacation yeah, it's, it's, like that. It's it's the smallest amount of people who have a farm big enough that they have like employees to run yeah. their shifts. It's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a full day job, yeah. And yeah, small I think businesses, the, yeah. if you don't work, you don't get paid. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only difference maybe would be that in Germany, just because of our culture, we're kind of used to taking vacation days yeah. more. So maybe farmers and uh, small business owners try a little bit harder to make mm-hmm. that happen for themselves because they see everyone else travel all the time. And in the U.S., I would kind of assume, this is just an assumption, that people don't even bother that much to try because nobody else does it either. Yeah, the discrepancy between the like employee life as opposed to self-employed life in the U.S. is smaller than in Germany. Mm. So that yeah, makes that's sense. True. Yeah, because in Germany, if you're employed, you get like four full <laughs> weeks and all these holidays and mm-hmm. stuff that we have. Yeah. But if you're also here in the U.S. when you're on vacation, you're not really on vacation. I still see people answering emails, being on meetings, yes. all these things. In Germany, like we had a, I mean, we're, we're for a German company. My colleagues are like, I emailed this employee and I get a message back. Hey, I'm out of the office. Your email will not be read or forwarded. I'm back in two weeks. Yeah. yeah, and it's, it's shifting a bit that people answer. And then I talked to my my boss in Germany who worked in Finland before. He said like, no, if somebody is on vacation in Finland, they are actually on vacation. There's no way to reach them. They are out. Mm-hmm. It's and really healthy. That's really healthy. And I saw it back over the last four years in my vacations. I don't think if I the only way I'm I'm not working is if I have no cell phone service. <laughs> Yeah, like we were literally in Puerto Rico hiking through the jungle with you and you'd like you were on vacation officially yes. and you'd always be on the phone like you'd always just step aside for a second, have a phone call or like we mm. were just driving, par- kind of like partying, singing to songs mm. and suddenly you have a business call on the on the speaker. Which which is not healthy and I really have to work on that myself, but it's just that the way this business works and yeah. I'm I'm so used to it. So I'm so last time we went on vacation in Hawaii and it was perfect because of the time difference. Because yeah. mm-hmm. it's a six hours from here, it's twelve hours from Germany. So as soon as it was like noon there, I couldn't call anyone. Yeah, it so was forced. That, that way I, I could really enjoy my like afternoon and evenings because I wasn't able to like call someone or somebody who was calling me. So that yeah. was super nice, and I really felt like I was relaxing more. Yeah, but when we were on vacation last time, it was really stressful. Yeah. And yeah. I'm getting better at it. So <laughs> yeah. now that I'm moving to Germany, I have to do the German way of working a little bit. 
Yeah. And some at some point I go to the finished model of not working <laughs> okay. at all. It, you're, yeah. That's part of your development plan. <laughs> yeah. It's a good plan. Um, did we talk about that last time? Uh, I don't remember in the episode about the difference between private life and work life and how there's kind of like a bigger difference in Germany. To be honest, I, I don't we, remember if we did. We'll touch base on it a bit. That, mm. like, I know my employees, like family. I know my customers. Like sometimes the family, what their names is, what they do, where the kids go to school. Yeah, we talked about that, but I was more thinking about like Arbeitszeit und Feierabend. So oh, like, yeah. how long do you work, and then after you're clocked out, you're just off, and you enjoy your time off, and you enjoy your weekend. And I feel like that work-life balance is works a little bit better in Germany because people don't expect you as much to it's, work yeah, it's, in, the expectations are different here it's like okay it's, it's, let's say it's 6pm I need something I'll, I know I can reach someone and they would answer the phone yeah. yeah. and also one thing I realized that when I was in Germany I was speaking, a lot of people have a work phone and a private phone mm -hmm. like a cell phone and here a lot of people have one phone yeah. and the Germans just leave their, their work phone at home if they go out in the evenings here you are always reachable you're always like on call basically yeah I don't and know how people do that That would bother me so much. Yeah. I, that's actually a topic that we talked about in the last last episode for, as for well. For me, it's the other way around. I'm bothered mm -hmm. if I don't have my work phone on me. Mm -hmm. But that's also something I need to change. <laughs> yeah. Um, I said it's more respected in Germany to not be reachable. Yeah. Yeah, and like a lot of the times, if it's the weekend, if it's like Friday, 3 p.m., you can't really expect to reach anyone anymore in Germany because a lot of offices get off early on Fridays mm -hmm. and everyone will be gone at like 3 or 4 p.m., especially if you're trying to reach a Behörde, so like an official <laughs> Good um, luck with office. That. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't get me started on that. It's my, my, <laughs> One of my roommates just had an experience with a Behörde that he just couldn't believe. He was on at wait for, I think, like 20 minutes. Um, and then after waiting for 20 minutes, he gets an automated message that just says, none of our, um, none of our people are, are available at this time. Please call back oh at another God. time. And then it automatically hangs up. So he oh pretty much God. was waiting till they went all home. And it yes, was like, yep, exactly. <laughs> that would like literally be a Behörden witz, like yeah. a joke about those people that they're just sitting there waiting, like leaving this people on hold and uh, yes. leaving this person on hold and then waiting until they can go home, which... From like first-hand stories, I know that that actually does happen sometimes. <laughs> the German public um, system does not work that well always, but that's a different topic. Yeah, it's definitely a better split in Germany. I feel like it's changing a bit to the U.S. model more, mm -hmm. which was also generation changes. But yeah, I like, like it. Yeah, like digitalization and stuff. And also, like I mean, I'm selling minerals. It's not that I'm a firefighter or like do something with rescue. If I'm not reachable, I can take care of it in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So maybe moving on to the next question, and this one is an interesting me question for me to get your guys' opinions on, um, but one of the listeners wrote in the comments, is there a glass ceiling for foreigners working for a German company? So I guess what he means by that is, do you, in your experience, have you seen non-Germans kind of discriminated or having a more difficult time moving up within a company or like getting into maybe a management position? Um, And are there any differences in your experiences in the U.S. versus Germany regarding that topic? Um, maybe start with Germany. Um, it, I think it heavily depends on where you work, what kind of industry it is. And I've, I've seen shifts. So when, when I started with the company I worked for, in the beginning, it was like, oh, we're looking for like a manager for a division or something. That, that person had to be German or at least speak German, live in Lübeck, and like do this and this and this, be specific. Now we're saying, hey... We'll just need somebody to fill this role. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter where he is or she is, or as long as she or he speaks English. So there's definitely been a shift. But in the past, yeah, I could have seen that the traditional like you're here the longest, you work here the, like mm -hmm. the, the longest, you have the best sales. Maybe you're German, you get promoted. That's definitely was happening, especially in the steel and mineral industry where where I was working. And then honestly, if I go to conferences or something, it is 99% Germans. Mm -hmm at least for the German market. But I've seen the switch, especially for international companies. They have hiring people from all around the world. Oftentimes they have to move, and uh, not to like the specific location, but at least the same content in a time zone or so. But yeah, there, there's definitely some kind of ceiling for, for foreigners still in German companies, especially if you work in a very traditional one. Mm -hmm. And I think on the other side, if you work for someone more tech orientated or marketing or PR, then it's, it's rather the opposite. They look for international talent. They look for international people more. 
Yeah, that's true. Especially if you're like from an English speaking country or like one of the because I feel like in Germany, we kind of make a difference there between, let's say, immigrants from um, the Arabic countries mm -hmm. or like if you're an expat who chooses to live in Germany for other reasons and you weren't like a refugee or something like that, um, which, of course, there shouldn't be a difference there. But I've definitely heard it from other people. Obviously, I like me as a German, I haven't really had that experience myself, but I've definitely heard that a lot of people when they have like a foreign sounding last name, like Turkish sounding or Arabic sounding, that they feel like they're being discriminated even in the application process, like they're not being invited mm -hmm. as much and um, just don't have the same chances to even get the jobs in the first place. When it comes to moving up, I mean, I personally, obviously, Niklas is like the expert here. I haven't had that much experience in those things and all the jobs that I've worked at in the past in Germany were all in media and mm -hmm. I feel like that's a different story too because you really need to have your language skills down for that yeah. whether it's like public relations like writing out um, press releases or being a journalist and being on the air for like a radio station obviously you need to be a native German speaker so we did not have a lot of foreigners per se I do know we had like you know Uh, people who were first generation German, so like yeah. had a foreign last name. And I feel like in that field, that didn't really matter at all. Like mm -hmm. I can actually think of a lot of colleagues that I had that were like Vietnamese or um, I don't even know where they all were from, honestly, but you could just tell that their last name wasn't like a classic German last name mm -hmm. um, or were like, you know, t Turkish or from another country. Um, I feel like in that field, that really didn't matter. But that's a more non-traditional field anyways. It really well, just when, matters. When it comes to management, I, I often hear the words like, hey, they have to understand the German war culture. They have to understand this. And that's yeah. pretty much implicate, hey, you have to be German. Yeah, they're like uh, trigger I, words. I'll, I'll see it, it changed, but also because our company is changing a bit, the, the company I work for. But I bet if you, if you go to classic like mid-sized German companies, you will have that typically, hey, we need someone Germans on top so he understands the culture. Yeah. And then when, when, when you switch to the US, um, yeah, like Midwest definitely still. But if I'm like for work in New York or somewhere in the bigger city, I think that the, the smaller... But I would, even, I would even argue in the Midwest, it's relatively common to have a non, like, how, how would you say, like US-born person in, in management positions. I mean, I, I worked in the Midwest and I had the majority of my bosses weren't Americans. So... Mm -hmm. Um, maybe when it comes to like far upper management, you might be right. Um, but I would say in the U.S., it's much, much more common to see people who were not um, born as Americans in in high leadership positions. And I think that also has to do with the quality, like quality yeah. of education. Um, I mean, I guess you guys talked about it, the way we are educated in Europe or in different parts of the world compared to U.S., that U.S. companies actually look for, for non-Americans or people who have experience from abroad. And then you have the problem as well that, or the, the, the benefit as well, there's a lot of people speak good English. Mm -hmm. A lot of people speak good English because they listen to it their whole life. They maybe had an exchange here, here and there's a way small amount of people that speak really good German. That's, yeah, true. that's true. But as you said, Niklas, like in Germany for the startup scene, it's completely oh, different. Yeah. Like if you're they are looking for people with all different kinds of native languages. And usually then the main language within the company will be English. Um, even for the Germans among each other, they will speak in English and then they like to have people from all over the world. So it really depends on the field that you want to work in. Exactly. And it's not even a matter of just startups. I mean, I think of um, the company where Letty and Chloe work, where, mm -hmm. who we interviewed as well. I mean, their work language is English, and I know one of mm -hmm. them has an, an American boss. Um, they have a Turkish boss. Like, they're, It's a very international company. So it really just yeah. depends on the company and also the field, I would say. Yes, it's definitely a field and a kind of industry. But I, I, I see changes, especially in the last five years, it, it has changed a lot. Yeah, and also definitely, I think in both countries, depends on whether you're in a city or in a more rural area. And um, I think if you look at New York City, like you said, Nicholas, yeah. I feel like every company is oh, yeah. super international there. I was like, there a few weeks ago going uh, working from a WeWork, from a shared co-working space. It was like, yeah, it was from all over the world, yeah. people. And it was, it was cool. It was a really cool yeah. experience. But then if I, if I go back to the conferences where I go to, then it's mostly male and American. Okay, so one more question um, that someone has was that if in businesses in Germany you're not supposed to talk personal issues or sports, what do you talk about? Do you talk about the weather all the time? I hope I get a response because I'm really curious about what your answer would be. Um, okay, so what do we talk most about? The weather is definitely a topic. 
Yes, you know, it's a very to, prevalent topic in the office. You really offices. need to be prepared. <laughs> and there's a joke in Germany about uh, that, that people who like talk about the weather as their job, like they in the news, they have no small talk topics. Their small talk <laughs> is literally their job. But no, I mean, weather is very like, oh, yeah, how's the weather? It's this, 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 this is what's coming up. Complain blah, blah, blah. about the weather, too. Complain about the weather, yep. which is which is a good topic because I was in Germany in November and there's definitely a lot of complaining <laughs> going on. It was nice and rainy. Um, I feel like sports a bit. You talk about sports mm-hmm. a bit, just not like in depth, like which team are you rooting for? Like, do you go to the games more like, hey, do you know what's going yep. on in the Bundesliga? Do you know what's going on there? Um, we talk a lot of business business related things you can also like small talk about business i feel yeah yeah that's i think what people do a lot in germany or at least in my experience is just if you you're in the kitchen together like preparing lunch or something or wherever you're like running into each other outside of your little workspace you just talk about the things that you're working on anyways yeah like you'll still say like oh or whatever it may be yeah, you'll still talk about like, oh, I'm working on this case or this is what I'm doing later or have you heard mm-hmm. about this? Or like, yeah, just like office talk kind of. Yeah, have yeah. you heard this these news and stuff like that? So I think, yeah, even within the work environment, people still have a lot of small talk about work. Yeah, it's like for us, it's like a lot of our shipping situation, uh, contracts that are open, yeah. supply chain issues, all these things. And also you don't have like that much interchange about your private life and your yeah. work life. It comes back to the topic, hey, we actually put your phone away if you're at home, you go on extra vacation, so mm-hmm. it's not overlapping that much. So you don't know that much about the other person's life. Yeah, you know, I was going to say that's been somewhat of an adjustment for me is like, because my normal small talk questions tend to be more personal type questions. <laughs> and I now that I'm thinking about it, my coworkers are probably like, Josh, quit asking me about my personal life. Just leave me alone. <laughs> So you're oh, coming gosh. into work, it's like, hey, what's your favorite meal? What do you have for yeah. breakfast? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, hey. <laughs> Exactly. How was your kid's math grade? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Except I do have to say, I mean, it really depends on the office, but I would say my current work culture is very unique because um, they do talk a lot about their personal lives. Um, but yeah, I would say generally. It's, I would it's the people that you work with was like really close that you'd also interchange like personal information. Yeah, yeah. But if I would go out here in, in, in the company I work in the US and I would talk to someone that uh, works in a different department, works in, in something completely different, I would immediately go into the sports into like I don't know yeah. what you do in a weekend where you're going on vacation and if I like when I'm in Germany and I'm, like, I'm in the kitchen getting a new coffee or something else mm-hmm. I would not ask that question yeah. and there's people I work with like for seven years now I would just ask <laughs> hey like what are you working on currently what's, what's going on like yeah. what's in your department these things mm-hmm. um, yeah you kind of keep that distance yeah the professional distance. <laughs> professional distance is important. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that was pretty good on like following up on you guys' your guys' questions that you asked in the comments. I mean, there was really a lot. There were a lot of yes. like, comments also, um, just additions to what we said. Um, so yeah, for those of you who are interested, you can also just go back to the last episode and read through that. I think it's just mm-hmm. really interesting to read by itself. But we have other stuff that we want to talk about today. We do, and I think... <laughs> It's kind of fun for me because now I take a back seat a bit. I mean, my heart is on one team, I have to say. But Feli is from the south of Germany, from Munich. And Niklas is from the north of Germany, like up near Hamburg and Lübeck. Um, and we wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between the two with you, Niklas. Um, oftentimes we've seen in, in some comments in our in our videos and just to the podcast that our, our perspectives are very Southern heavy or Bavaria centric. Um, and the same goes for the US too, being very Midwest centric. But as you are from the North, we thought it would be interesting to get some of your perspectives um, on on the South, vice versa, and learn a little bit more about the North from from a real Northerner. We'll say. Real Northerner. <laughs> yeah, as, as Josh said, I was, I was born and raised just outside of Hamburg, north of Hamburg, close to Lübeck. And I mean, it's, it's like not that different from where where Feely is, but there are some clear differences if you talk yeah. about language. I think if I would talk to my grandma in our local dialect, and if Feely would talk to her grandma in her local dialect, we would have a hard time understanding <laughs> each other. And I think we were somewhere, I don't know where we were, Feely, but I ordered a Zeta, so which is yeah. sparkling water, and you were like, what is that? I have no idea what that is. No, I think I already knew that, because like, I didn't oh, know oh, what that was. Be- 
No, but I, I no, I actually didn't know that from Hamburg. I didn't know what, what that was, like what that word was until I came to the U.S. because here they call it seltzer okay. also for like sparkling water. Um, I would always um, say Sprudelwasser or Mineralwasser yeah. or whatever, like uh, Wasser mit Blub or <laughs> whatever people call it, <laughs> mit Gas. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I never knew that that Zelta was a German word. Yeah, maybe it's, it's maybe like a, you taught maybe you told me about it, but I already I understood it. I think I just yeah, didn't realize that German used that I was word. in Munich and I, I tried to order a Zelta, and they were they like, "What do you want from me?" And, yeah, and then there's a small difference, like where What's we make voiced? fun of each <laughs> we make fun of each other. Where like there's a, a saying in northern Germany, "We eat salmon," and in the south they eat fish sticks because you're so far from the ocean. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's it. I think it's from a from a song. It's like okay. um, it's called Nordish by Nature by Fetch. Ah, cool. okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Everybody should should listen to that. I think it's like eleven minutes of, of talking about how great North Germany is. <laughs> well, we'll uh, link it down below. I mean, yes. the whole song is in German, but maybe there's also a translation out there somewhere. There's probably a translation out somewhere. Yeah. And then, I mean, you guys always make fun of us that we don't even know what a real mountain is, which is yeah. probably true. Yeah, because <laughs> the is. northern part of Germany is pretty flat, and then it goes like into the two oceans that we have, and the Wattenmeer and everything, and like the Hamburg area just also has. A huge harbor, uh, lots of water, so it's just a different scenery up there. Yeah, so, no, sorry, go ahead, Josh. No, I just was going to say one of the questions we wrote down, or also some of the, one of the questions that um, someone wrote in the comments was, "Do you guys even feel like you're from the same country because they're so different?" So oh, the person who no, wrote Josh, this was, I, w- I wrote that. Well, no, but then <laughs> also someone also wrote. Oh. Um, like for example, they said, I think that being that Niklas being from Schleswig-Holstein and Felicia being from Bavaria is similar to me being from Massachusetts and Josh being Josh being from Ohio. We're both American, but it's it's pretty different. Okay. So I mean, what are your perspectives on that? Like when you Feli were in the north, did you feel like you were almost in a foreign country? And Niklas, when you're in the south, does it feel really different to you? I, I mean, not- honestly. Uh, you go ahead, Nick. Just, you're not, the guest. <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm in a different country, for sure. Yeah. But there is a lot of these jokes, especially because uh, Bavaria is a, a Freistaat. I don't know how you translate it. It's, there's some like different regulations. There's some small differences. And then it's just like also another joke when someone says, hey, what's your favorite international soccer team? I say Bayern Munich. You know, like these kinds of things. So it's a lot of joked about because different religions, first of all, Protestant and uh Catholic. Yeah, so the, uh, the south of Germany is more traditionally Catholic, so Bavaria is pretty traditionally Catholic, yeah. whereas I feel like all, the whole rest of Germany is more Protestant. I don't know really where the definitely, boundaries are. Definitely in the north and yeah. where I'm from. But yeah, and then it's there's some like different rules, and uh, you have an, a party with the CSU that we don't have in the rest of Germany. But yeah, so not, Bavaria really has an extra Wurst sometimes, which so means like it's kind of like a special position within the country, and a lot of people hate on um, Bavaria, and a lot of Bavarians sometimes jokingly, sometimes seriously, claim that they're like better than the rest of Germany or they're yeah. their own country. Um, sometimes people compare it to the position that Texas has within the U.S. So like Bavaria is the Texas of Germany. I personally like <laughs> never felt that myself. Like I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, we're like so different and special and better than the rest of Germany. Um, but I, I, that's definitely a thing. And a lot of people kind of don't like Bavaria from other parts of Germany. It's not that we don't, we don't like it. It's just you're born making jokes about it. Mm. It's like there's so many jokes out there. And then uh, sometimes when uh, something's going wrong in Germany, there's a big debate and Bavaria has a different different opinion. A lot of people say, oh, Bavaria is planning to become their own country. They want to become their yeah. own country. We can, I don't know, we can switch them out with Mallorca. Like there is, <laughs> which Mallorca is an island in Spain where a lot of people, Germans, go uh, for vacation to. And it's jokingly called the 17th Bundesland, so like the 17th German state. But yeah, I mean, that's the same with Bavarians making fun of like Preussen. So basically yeah. everything that's not Bavaria we call like Preussen, um, which used to be a kingdom, not the rest of Germany Prussia used in to English, be Preussen. Yeah. Prussia, yes. Um, that's just like kind of a, a rivalry that's partly like a joke, but sometimes can also get kind of real. Like I've definitely mm-hmm. talked to people also that took that pretty seriously and that actually hated Bavaria and Bavarians <laughs> or that actually hated everyone who's not Bavarian. Um, so, yeah, you can definitely talk about it like that. But also I want to give some background information because I think maybe some of our listeners and viewers don't know this. Mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of people, when they talk about the different regions within Germany, talk about the north versus the south. But also, of course... Germany is much more diverse than just 
just yeah. north versus south. That's just like kind of a pretty obvious difference because of what we just talked about, especially Bavaria versus the rest of Germany, kind of. But we have so many different regions within Germany, so many different dialects, and there is differences between all of them, basically. Another, like, major difference, if you want to talk about, like, the big ones would probably be east versus west. So like I would former. say that that's a bigger part for me. I would yeah. feel more like in a different country if I go east than I would yes. go, go south, mm. just because it was split for such a long time. But uh, my, my wife's grandparents, they are from east Germany, or the yep. eastern part, and they grew up in that time frame. And if I go there, it's like same language and everything, but it's kind of different culture, different kind of food. And that's probably just a two-hour drive from where yeah. I grew up. So but as soon as you cross the old border, it's different. Yeah, and you also, the, everything looks different. Not everything, yeah. but a lot of things look different also. But maybe you could go into a little sorry. bit more detail on what looks different or what feels different about it when you're there. You said there's some different foods. Um, so uh, different foods, more like, okay, it was the eastern part of Germany. So until the, the wall was down and everything in in 90, uh, it was a different, different life there. Mm -hmm. And they live on the countryside. So it's just a different kind of lifestyle, different kind of mentality. They always just plan about... The next year, how can we survive the next year? Like a lot of like homemade food, um, eating whatever there is. Um, for example, if they, they get like a pig or something from the butcher, they eat the whole thing because mm -hmm. they are used to eating all of this. And then it's just a different mentality when it comes to politics, a different mentality when it comes to, to allies in the world because they have the, the Russian Eastern German education. And if you learn that for 30 years, it's hard to get out of your head. Yeah, so, a lot of people there also still speak Russian because back in the day they would learn Russian as their second language, whereas a lot of the West Germans would learn English. Correct. And of course, there's a general generational difference too. I yeah. mean, the younger Germans who are in the East, I would say, are don't have that influence, obviously, because they grew up in the unified Federal Republic of Germany. Yeah, it kind of depends. They don't have that mindset, but politically, what um, Nick yes. just said, you can see if you look at like a political map, the difference between what parties um, are governing is mm -hmm. literally the same border as the former GDR. Yeah, yeah. And that's also young people, too, which I think they just get influenced by their environment, mm -hmm. by their parents, grandparents, etc. And it just kind of took on its own dynamic there. Obviously, that's not something that when you visit there, you notice right away. But I mean, you'll see it on the news. You'll probably notice it when you're there that you, you might see more posters for certain parties and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's a major difference still. But I think also what you see right away is how like the streets are, are different there. Um, and a lot of things are just empty because uh, a, a lot of young people leave. Yes. They, they have a massive problem with, with young people leaving and they do a lot of efforts to get young talent back into the East. And then you have the typical Plattenbau. Um, yeah. It's the, the, the East European structure of, of building houses, very simple, really like easy, cement, like just, just yeah. being being cheap and, and mm -hmm. fast to build. And you can still see that in, yeah. in a lot of houses, especially if you go into the cities. So, um, I've, yeah, if I, I mean, I haven't been in Munich that often, maybe two, three times in my life. But it looks more German to me than like the East. Yeah, and the thing yeah. is too, because you're from the Hamburg area, I feel like Hamburg and Munich are actually pretty comparable as cities. Um, that's what yeah. I like to say at least, because I feel like those are two of the most beautiful, bigger cities in Germany. There's a lot of small towns that are really pretty. Um, and you might they have are. I've said a lot of people here, Philly. Saying this, Hamburg and Munich are very similar. <laughs> I, th I think so. Just like the I, I, vibe. I agree. I agree. And like a lot of bougie a lot of rich people, <laughs> and the rents are expensive in both cities. Yeah. Um, and I actually lived in Hamburg for three months. That wasn't like a super long time. But um, getting back to that initial question, like whether you feel like you're in the same country, whether you're in the north or in the south. I mean, I've also like visited other places in no the north, of course, like Berlin or like Rügen, like Nordsee, mm -hmm. um, Ostsee, those places. And the only thing that I would say is like you feel like the scenery is very different because mm -hmm. obviously growing up in Munich, you're not used to having a German beach <laughs> like yeah. ocean or anything like that. Um, and the weather like is kind of known to be even worse up there than it is down south, even mm -hmm. though Germany doesn't have the best weather in general or not the most reliable, but I think it's even worse like in the northern area, especially because of the ocean, because of that climate. Um, but no, I feel like, you, yeah, you feel like you're in the same country wherever you go. The only like major difference for me that comes to mind, and those are like minor differences, 
is that, for example, you suddenly have to use a few different words yeah. when you're like in a different place. So with like big cities, of course, not a lot of people speak strong dialect anymore these days because most people in the big cities do know how to speak standard German. So like you can still understand everyone. But what I would probably do is I wouldn't say Servus a lot in the northern moin. part of Germany. Yeah, you kind of adjust. You just say mm -hmm. Moin or Hallo or something. And then um, if you go to the bakery and you order something, um, if you order a bread roll, of course, you don't order a yes. Semmel, but you order a Brötchen. Yeah. So it's just like these little things that change. And then the one thing that comes to mind that was different in Hamburg was that it had this um, drugstore that we don't have in southern Germany. But that's Butni. A Butni? Yeah, Butni doesn't <laughs> oh, exist. You don't, have in, it. Hmm? you don't have it in Munich? No. Butni only exists in, I don't know where the boundary is, but I think it only exists in the northern part of Germany huh. for some reason. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why. I don't think it's I know it from Erfurt when I lived there either. It's mm -hmm. a solid store. It's good. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like, like a DM, Osman basically. DM, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's what I was going to say, too. And to kind of bringing somewhat of the American perspective into it, I think you can tell that you're somewhat in a different place. Like, you're not back. You're not at home. Like, when I go to the north of Germany, like, it doesn't... When I'm in Austria, for example, you feel like you're in Austria because the road signs yep. are similar but different. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have that when you're in the north of Germany and you live in the south. But you do feel like you're, like you said, the scenery is somewhat different and the people speak slightly differently. Um, whereas in the U.S., it depends obviously where you go. Um, but most of the places where I've vacationed, I've never really had to change my vocabulary yeah. um, to make myself understood or just to fit in. I always can speak relatively normally. Um, or completely normally and not have that that impact. So I think in, in that sense, I, I do feel like there's a significant, significant, quote unquote, um, difference between the north and south of Germany. But, but I really the, feel like in, it's just minor things these yeah, days. Yeah, Except if you, for example, go for, to like a small town or like a rural area where people actually still speak strong dialect, then that would be a, an extreme um, situation, I think. I know that, for example, the movie Schuld is Money too, that was a huge <laughs> German success, German movie, but it was mainly in Bavarian dialect. That was mm -hmm. like the comedy part of it. I know that some northern Germans did not understand that movie or had to watch it with subtitles. So if you go to the dialects, then yes, there is a pretty big divide. But nowadays, not a lot of people, modern people, speak strong dialect anymore. Yeah. No, and, and I mean, in northern Germany, there's a language called Plattdeutsch, yep. which is like flat German. Uh, low low German is. Low German. Yeah. And I understand it without any issues, but I can't speak it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I just, because I, I never really learned it. And if my, my mom talks to her sister and they speak in, in, in flat German or low German, it's it's easy for me to understand. But then if my aunt is there who got married into the family and she's from Cologne, she has no idea what's going on. Yeah. But Did you understand can... Shooter's Money too? Yes. Okay. Not all of it probably, but I mean, it's... It's not it's, like it's, super strong dialect. No. It's more like it's a few Josh words. Goes, and... If Josh goes to Alabama, he gets <laughs> what people are saying, but he doesn't understand every single word. Yeah, probably. <laughs> if they speak like strong Southern yeah. accent, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think Alabama is a place where I had the most problems understanding people's language. Really? Alabama? Yeah. About the rural parts, if mm -hmm. you go somewhere. But that was going to be a question I had for you, Niklas, is like, I know that you said that you understand Plattdeutsch or Low German, um, but like in the community that you grew up in, did most people speak that? Like, at least of your parents' generation with each other? Like, if your parents yes. are, are in a, like a local, like a local bar or something, would they be speaking... Uh, low German or would they mostly low German definitely low German okay. um, and then a lot of people like the people who work on the farms and all that the, the younger generation still speaks it but everybody else never really learned it because mm -hmm. my parents always spoke like in, in normal like standard German with me but okay. when they speak to especially relatives or old friends they, they switch into you know, low German mm -hmm. it's so sad that these things are kind of dying I, I wish I could speak it it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of cool language It is. It's uh, related to Dutch also. Um, it's like a mix of like Dutch, English, everything. Yeah. yeah. So and do you have... Sorry, do just you... wanted to no, throw that fine. in there for all the <laughs> language nerds. <laughs> um, but so do you have friends like who are in our, like around our age who speak it fluently? Yeah, especially people who are like still work on farms, okay. who work with the older generation still, who they, they speak it. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll probably have a few words that I throw in here and there that I just like, I mean, you guys always say when I say hot dog. I think that's just, <laughs> that's my, just your pronunciation. That's just your accent. But, more but than that, like, I think that that comes from from that language yes. because a lot of like 
it's like a lot of things are mushed together in, in low yes. German. It's like, but, and I actually had at school, I had a few like lessons on that and they tried to teach it to us, but the kids were just not interested in it. That's cool though that they tried. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any like example sentences? I know you said that you don't speak it fluently, but you understand it. But like, do you have a few sentences that you can say in Plattdeutsch and then tell us what it sounds like in standard German just for the listeners? Because we talk about Bavarian quite a bit. But. Yeah, um, it's it's more like uh, like Semmel, Philip brought that example. Yeah. We call it Rundstück, Rundstück warm. It's more like you, you change a bit the tone of your language and uh-huh. then uh, Guten Tag instead of Guten Tag, like okay. good day. It's like the small things. I I probably can come up with some next time I'm here. I'll bring okay, some yeah. examples. I mean, I didn't want to put you I on the spot. I, no, I, I have some text that I had to learn as a kid, or I just asked my mom. Like uh-huh. a poem or something? Yeah, I should I should know way more. Of, <laughs> but, you know, I haven't been home in forever. So. Shame on you, Niklas. Shame on Shame you. Shame on me, yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, For I was getting my say, culture. I was going to say just about, like, the accent. Even people like you who just speak standard German in your everyday life, you can definitely hear that there's pronunciation differences. For example, I mean, we kind of refer, or I think everyone in Germany kind of refers to, like, the northern people as, like, fish cup or something like that. Fish cup is uh, a good example, like yeah. The, the fish head, um, and that's also kind of pronounced with the accent, and then like sheet veda, um, she veda. <laughs> is like a Hamburg term. Um, that I think sheet is like a, a Plattdeutsh term for no. like uh, sh- means scheiß, right? Scheiß, shit. Yeah. yeah, so it's yeah. kind of like a mix of English and German, as uh-huh. you can tell, like sheet. Um, and, then and then veda, veda instead is, of is a, veta. That's like the double D instead of the double T and stuff like that. And then, yeah, yeah, so a little Fish. bit like the American accent compared to the British one. Like in Northern German, they kind of try to pronounce the T's more like D's and, and things like that. Mutter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of, um, what I just was going to say, sticking with the topic of dialects, though, do you feel like there are um, stereotypes or prejudices that people have um, towards dialect speakers in the North? Like... I, I know at least here in the South, in my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, Feli, because obviously you have more experience than I do when it comes to Bavarian, Bavarian. But I feel like the people who speak dialect here tend to be pretty proud of it um, in Bavaria. Is that the case in the North? And I feel like there's less prejudice towards the people here in the South who speak dialect than there may be in the North. But that's no, just I, my perspective. Like it's it's, it's totally normal if you speak uh, lower German. It's totally normal and respected. There's no issue. When it comes to dialect, I mean, Bavarian dialect, we don't... We know it. It's, it's not that bad. I feel like people who are from Saxony, like who speak is Zexish, that's what everybody makes fun of. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's like considered more. the least sexy accent and dialect in Germany. <laughs> yeah. So no, I mean, if if you speak with a dialect in Northern Germany, it's, it's perfectly normal, and you can go to a restaurant or somewhere and order. But are people issue. even proud of it if they can speak like? I'm talking about though, if in the north speaking your northern dialect, so like Plattdeutsch, as opposed to like the, Bavarians coming to the north. Dep- depends on the generation, I think. Mm. Um, I-, I think it's really cool if someone speaks a dialect. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm really impressed by it because you pretty much learn another language. Yeah. Mm. I honestly think, though, um, Josh, getting back to your question, that's a thing in all of Germany mm-hmm. that people are kind of proud of their dialects. And it's because it has been dying out so much. Yeah. And like a lot of families, just what Nikla said, it's the same in Bavaria. If you work like in the rural areas or on a farm, it's still pretty normal even for young people to speak the dialect and speak that with each other. With older people, it's exactly the same what Nikla said. A lot of older people speak it with each other, but then they don't speak it to their kids or they mm. speak like a like a lower version or like a smaller version of it to their kids. And so I have a lot of friends whose parents speak strong Bavarian dialect, but for some reason the kids speak standard German. And Mm -hmm. I sometimes don't even know where it comes from. It might be just the school system and the other kids that they grew up with, but they will then sometimes turn to their parents and kind of speak slightly more Bavarian, but Mm -hmm. then speak standard German with everyone else. And so it's kind of, yeah, really dying out. And I think if you still can speak it, it's more like this, like having a a second language skill almost these days. It's like, can you speak it or are you uncool and you can only speak standard German? It's like a badge of honor. Yeah, it is. But back in the day, that was not the case. Like a few decades ago, as you said, Josh, like, Sometimes dialects had like a negative connotation to them. Like if you spoke a strong dialect instead of standard German, you were maybe considered uneducated or Mm -hmm. just, yeah, maybe like more of stupid farmer instead of an intellectual city person. Mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of changed these days because 
the dialect's just not as common anymore. And pretty much everyone nowadays, probably also because of the media, knows how to speak standard German. I mean, the radio is standard German, the the newspaper. I, I think there was a time where we had like a part of the newspaper was in, in lower German. But I, I mean, we have crazy. definitely some Bavarian dialect segments on radio stations, for example. Like I know that on some radio stations in Bavaria, they allow people to have like the accent because, for example, because I, I used to work in radio. And if you work in radio and you have a strong dialect, it's really tricky because they require you to speak standard German. And a lot of Bavarians roll their R's. So even when they do speak standard German, their pronunciation isn't exactly the same as it's supposed to be. So people either can't work for media or they have to go to a speech therapist yeah. and learn how to pronounce the regular R in the back of your throat, like a R instead of a R. And um, there are some radio stations, though, in Bavaria <laughs> <laughs> um, that allow people to have the Bavarian accent mm -hmm. because they're like, yeah, we're celebrating our culture, so it's okay if the host It's also local the stations. I mean, people like to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but usually, though, yeah, as you said, everything is in standard German. I mean, the TV stations are usually, and I think that's different um, compared to the U.S., most TV stations in Germany are nationwide. I mean, we have some local channels, but they don't really play that big of a role. And so those are usually in standard German. So I have one more question, um, actually, for the both of us, Niklas. So when you think of traditional food from your area, what is that? Yes. Um, definitely, definitely fish heavy. So we mm -hmm. talked about the salmon fish sticks comparison, uh, fish brötchen. Yeah. So it's like it's just like uh, we talk herring. I don't even know what the translation is. Herring. We had a herring. <laughs> we had a, we had a discussion at work about like the different kind of herring. If you eat them like in a certain season, they're called differently. You uh, can yeah. put oh, them really? in like some kind of marinade, and mm -hmm. so I I love everything that's like just like there's bread with some fish on it, and then there's yep. like I eat it raw, I eat it cooked, I eat it whatever it is, fried. Mm -hmm. um, so very that heavy, very potato heavy. Mm -hmm. But I think, Fili, you also you That's the eat same, a lot yeah. But That's the same in South, South Germany. Yeah, so like a potato soup, a potato with like different kind of vegetables in it. Um, yep. We eat knudel, mm -hmm. similar to what you do. Um, meat heavy, a lot of pork, a lot of, lot of, lot of beef. But yep. I think the main thing for us is really we eat a lot of fish, just being close to the ocean. Yeah. Uh, so what do you guys eat for Christmas, like in your family, for example? Um, raclette or fondue. Oh, okay. okay, so that's not traditional. <laughs> that's <laughs> do not you know anyone in your area that has like a traditional Christmas meal? Uh, so traditional would be a, a duck. Okay, yeah, good. That's the same in, uh, yeah, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the same in Bavaria too, though. I yeah, was thinking maybe you guys have like fish for sort of Christmas fish thing, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. No, that's more like an Easter thing. When yeah, that's fish. the same in, in South Germany too, though, because it's like um, Good Friday and stuff like that. You're not yeah. supposed ah, to eat. Ah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I would say the main difference for us is, is the fish brötchen. Yeah. We eat, eat it, you get to go to the fish market in the morning and get it, get it right there. It's it's perfect. Uh, crabs from the Northern Sea, mm -hmm. you eat that on on bread on a regular basis. That are the the main <laughs> no, things. I'm yeah, I'm, uh, I have to get some food. <laughs> so now you're hungry again, Nicholas, after all that oh, turkey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I have uh, I have another follow-up question. Yes. Um, so in the U.S., as we all know, a lot of people equate Germany with Bavaria. Kind of German culture is Bavarian culture, Bavarian food, Dirndl's Lederhosen, Oktoberfest. How does that make you feel or like how, yeah, how do you react to that? Do you I mean, feel was, left out? That, that brings us back to the thing that we discussed earlier when they say, hey, are you wearing Lidl's at home? Are you going to talk to us? I was like, nah, this is like the crazy people in Bavaria that do that stuff. Yeah. And then we explained that, hey, like we actually live closer to Denmark than we probably live to Berlin, for, yeah. at least where I grew up. Yeah. So um, it doesn't like, it's not that that a big difference from what we do, but as, as I guess you guys discussed in the podcast, there's a standard view that Americans have of Germany that we all sit there with our Britzel and our Lederhosen yeah. and either Haxe. Um, I don't know, it doesn't feel me left left out. It's like when I think of the U.S. before I moved here, I thought of New York and L.A., and that's yeah. like a very mm -hmm. small part of what the U.S. is. So I and I also if I have visitors here from Germany, I had my boss was here and some other colleagues here in the last weeks, the first time in the U.S. and they had this American skyscraper skyline, fast paced yeah. New York image and then they come to Cincinnati and see hey the US is actually something completely different. But we also have so, a skyline in Cincinnati though. Yeah, I was going to say skyline. Cincinnati has beautiful a nice skyline. skyline. I like but the it, Cincinnati skyline. It, it, yeah, yeah, they they actually they but so I picked my boss up in in New York and we were only at the airport so we didn't really see the city and went through like Pennsylvania, so Pittsburgh mm -hmm. area long drive. 
through West Virginia, Kentucky into Cincinnati. Mm. And that took us about five days with all the customers and suppliers and all these things. So they were like, their first impression of the U.S. was like that kind of U.S., which is a different like, the more like countryside, Midwest, or, yeah. like, you know. And they was like, hey, we're like the, the New York kind of U.S. And the same as the, in, in Germany. People expect Bavaria, but when they're in Hamburg, yeah. they get something different. Yeah. I just thought it was funny when you were explaining like, the traditional food. I'm so not used to hearing brezel, brezel. <laughs> that it stands out, and also haxe. <laughs> Just I hearing. think brezel is technically the the um, proper official, yeah, 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 standard German term. What for do you, it. What do you guys say? Brezel. So in. Brezel. So yeah, in Munich you say brezel with like just an e in the end, but in Bavarian you would say brezel. Brezel. Yeah. Brezel. Was ja Oberster? Oberster. Oberster ist Oberster. That's yeah. I, I never knew what it was before I was in oh, Munich. Oh, ein ja. <laughs> <laughs> I just have no idea what that is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a weird term. It's that, this oh, spread for those That's few. where it comes from. Ah, yeah, I, th- okay. I mean, I think so. That's what and I was always sense. taught. Yeah, well, sense. like, it's like an becomes yeah, yeah. yeah um, I mean, it that still doesn't really make sense, but it kind of just means a... What, how would you translate that into English, Josh? <sighs> don't ask Angebats. me these questions. <laughs> oh, but I, I just... Another thing for, for food. I don't know if you do you eat it, like green cabbage with like sausage in there. Is that a, that's probably an North German thing, like yeah, green I think cabbage, so. like really like hearty, like good, like like a green cabbage stew with like a nice like fatty sausage in there. That's I think very North, like North say, Eastern I, German. I haven't seen that much down here. No, so I good. think that's more northern. I mean, all different uh, regions of Germany have their own food, of course, like not mm. just North versus South. And the thing with sausages is. All regions have their own sausages. There's like hundreds of different types mm-hmm. of sausages in Germany. I think that's part of the traditional food everywhere, basically. It's just made differently. I just was going to mention one more thing, too, before we move on from the topic of um, from of food. But, I mean, I've been to the north of Germany twice, I guess, because I went to the, the Ostsee, so the, to the Baltic Sea, and then also to visit Feli when she was living in Hamburg. Um and I, one of my roommates at some point came from Niedersachsen, which obviously isn't quite as far north, but they made like a traditional northern meal for me once. And it was pretty much exactly what you were saying was fish and potatoes like that. And I think they had some onions, too, that we ate with it because I don't know. Matthias, I don't know how you say that in English, but it, it's herring. It's just ah, different, OK. It's just that's what we So Matthias is just I'm probably I'm wrong. Enough. It's like <laughs> be, be, when the herring is still young. So okay. it's like a certain kind of season when you have to catch it, and then it comes herring, and then there's also roll mops, and there's a lot of different things, but it's the same fish in the end. Ah, okay. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that because I don't eat that, but that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so Matthias, I think that's the raw one, correct, Josh? It's I just like know I eat it. It, it yeah. is cold. I do remember eating it cold. I think it's raw and cold, and you put it in, or you put it into different sauces or whatnot. It's so good, though. <laughs> I, I, really good. I'll never forget. I really, being want, on... I really want one. <laughs> Being on the being on at the Baltic Sea and eating a fresh Matthias Brötchen, it was delicious. Yeah, they actually had Matthias Brötchen at the Chicago Christkindl Market that I just really? went to. Yeah, they have they're super authentic there. Like I actually didn't expect it, but they have also Duna there, and they have lots of vendors from Germany. They fly in from Germany for like a month or two. Wow! And there was a whole Northern German booth there with like Matthias Brötchen and Rollmops and Fischbrötchen, etc. So I went ever... three years ago. It was mm-hmm. pretty good. We were there. Oh, well, actually, for Thanksgiving three years ago, we went there, and we went to the nice. the Chris Keller markets. Yeah, it was yeah. really impressive for being in the U.S. Yeah, feels like Germany almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> feels more like Germany than Bavaria does right now with no uh, <laughs> Christmas markets. No Christmas markets. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was saying, too, because that was the day when they announced that. And I was really looking forward to going mm-hmm. home for Christmas and having all the Christmas markets. And then that exact day that I went to Chicago, they were like, yep, all Christmas markets are going to be canceled in Bavaria. So I was like, OK, good that I'm in Chicago now. And at least I get to experience <laughs> yeah. it here instead. Do they still do the Cincinnati one or has that died out? So. I, I haven't seen so. anything yet. OK. In Lübeck, they are, so I was in Lübeck last week and they were preparing for the Christmas market and all the different vendors were right there. I'm not know. I'm not sure if it's happening, but mm. Lübeck is also kind of famous, not as big as like Nuremberg or Munich yeah. or something, but it's, it's kind of famous. Yeah, I mean the Nuremberg one is like the most famous one, um, and that's also in Bavaria, unfortunately. So that also got canceled. Supposedly, Which Erfurt sucks. has a really really nice Christmas market mm. as well. I'm like not super positive that all these are going to stay open. I feel like step by step, all these different cities are going to close theirs too. Yeah. But I'm really hoping that some are going to stay open, and I can just travel to a different city and just. Yeah. Go there instead. 
We can come to Lübeck. <laughs> yes, I can. I can, maybe. Just My plans still aren't set in stone yet, but I might. <laughs> <laughs> So, Niklas, we kind of mentioned it at the beginning, um, but you're now moving back to Germany. Do you want to tell us some about that? Yeah, correct. I'm, I'm moving back to Germany. Uh, my time here in the U.S. Is, is, is officially over end of the year. It was originally planned for end of next year, but with some personal changes at work, the opportunity came up to move back to Lübeck and go into a good position. So I talked to my wife. I was like, yeah, it's been four years for us together living here, five years for me in total in the U.S. Wow. It's, it's a good time frame, and we're ready to go back home, I think, not being able to travel for two years definitely factored into the decision, not seeing mm-hmm. your family for such a long time. Yeah. But yeah, we, we started the process about two months ago, um, sold the house, which luckily in the today's market was super easy. Um, I mentioned to you guys earlier when we talked, like we're sleeping on the, on the floor on a mattress because we already sold the bed. The guest bed is sold, some chairs, some tables, all these things. We're not taking anything home besides our dog. And, really? So it's um, not like you're taking a, you're filling a container and moving stuff. No, not at all. You're it's selling just, everything. It, it makes no sense. It's so expensive shipping a container right now. Yeah, true. Just bringing it to Germany makes no sense. Our furniture is just not worth that much. Yeah. And it's the good IKEA things. I mean, I really like everything, but yeah. we were able to sell most of it, and the rest we're just gonna donate. And it's also nice to just clean house. I mean, mm-hmm. the amount of like clothing and like little things that we just don't need, we never used, yeah. we were able to donate or give to our friends is amazing. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, we, we've been going through that process. Um, it's not as complicated as, as you think. We're just gonna go back to Germany. We already have a new apartment there that we're gonna move into beginning of next year. We're gonna live at our parents first. And then you just go to the, the behörde. You go to the, the local, local age, what do you call it? local agency, local, mm-hmm. local government and say, Hey, I'm back. I'll live in Germany again. Where do you live? Here and here. You go back into your normal health insurance. You're going back into your normal things and, and you're good to go. There's probably some hurdles on the way that we will encounter, but so far it's been, been going pretty smooth. And we're lucky that we're able to sell a lot of things like cars and house mm-hmm. and. I don't know, like the TV and all these things. It's, it's yeah. going to be really smooth. And I'm looking forward to living back in Germany. As I mentioned during the podcast, I was home last week and it was just, it just felt right to be back. Mm. You know, the food, the culture, the people, everything was, was good. Um, we have a little good pie party actually tomorrow, which will be very hard saying goodbye to oh. our friends. But um, it's not that we are out of this world. I mean, Fili, you know it from traveling back and forth. It's, it's still a simple flight. We can be in within 12 hours without any issues. And you'll um, be we'll, here for work anyways, right? I'll be here for work. Um, we already have a trip planned in, in May for a wedding of, of friends of ours. Um, I'm going to take my family here in the summer. Mm-hmm. So I'll probably be back like two, three times a year. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and also for my colleagues, and like, it's not that I'm leaving the company. I'm just going into a different position in a different region. So it's, it's the only thing that really changes where I live. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say that makes it a little easier as far as like not having to renegotiate or I mean, as far as contracts, like at a new new company, like that's all staying relatively the same for you. It's, it, just, it's a very smooth trend. That, so I was in Germany, met my new team, talked to them, slowly yeah. transitioning out here, transitioning in there. Mm-hmm. It's going all very, very smooth and it's, it's, it's a good progress. And then I'm just looking forward to travel in Europe. That's really the mm-hmm. main thing. I'm, mm-hmm. I haven't seen as much of Europe as I would like because I moved relatively early and I was in school before a trainee so I didn't have the money to to travel yeah and now I've, I've never been to London like I mm. it's not that far from where where we live mm. I've never been to France like all these small things that's on, on the plan for next year yeah and yes. I, mean, I mean the five years in the US people always ask me hey Nicholas how was it? I was like I will do it all again mm-hmm. without any issues it was a lot of fun I got great experience made great friends um yeah maybe but it's, I think it's, uh, it's time to go home after five years yeah. I think five years so is, a, think, is a good time. Do you think another year, like initially planned, would have been too long? No. If the pandemic would have not been and I would be able to travel back and forth, not at all. I mean, now it's like we're at the point after five years where we both have jobs that we like. We have a house, a dog, friends. We have a whole life here. Yeah. But the, the part that's missing is the family. Yeah, yeah for like sure. We don't, we don't have the- a family the reason that you guys weren't able to travel back, because I mean, listeners probably know that I traveled back throughout the pandemic, is because you guys have a different visa and Correct. you weren't, it, it was just that they wouldn't have let you back into the US, right? Yeah, I was able to leave, but I wasn't able to go back in with my kind of visa, which was kind of weird. But yeah. Um, yeah, so if we don't have, we don't have kids, so if we would have kids, we would be able to travel back and forth, or if we would okay. have a green card, mm. um, it's different. Yeah, it was really specific and 
they opened up the borders for us to come back in, I think, on the 8th of November, and I took a flight back two days after. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> that's awesome. Like, yeah, for you said first getting, time home in two years, right? Yeah, first time home that's in two crazy. years. It's like so much change. Like my, my best friend built a whole farm in the house that I've never seen before. Damn, like, that's pretty like, crazy. I'm, I haven't seen my family in two years. I mean, with Zoom and FaceTime and everything, you, you talk to them on like on a weekly so or daily same, basis. Though. Yeah. But it was awesome. it's just like I walked through Lübeck, had a Duna, had a fish brooch in, <laughs> and I actually came home Saturday evening. And my parents were like, do you want to eat something special? I was like, no, just give me bread and cold cuts. I'm very, <laughs> very happy with that. Yes. And I had so much bread and I was so happy. <laughs> and then I went, went uh, out on the Reeperbahn with some friends, had some German beer. Uh, realized that it's way cheaper to go out there than in here, mm -hmm. which was great. Like three beers and two shots is like 12 bucks. And yeah. I was, this is amazing. And I was so happy. And the, the guy behind the bar didn't understand what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to living back in Germany. And then I'll, I'll travel back and forth to the US. I still have yeah. like a lot of friends here. And but I feel like also a lot of people from since then he moved all around the world in the US. That's mm -hmm. true. So from the point where I moved here, and I think I met you first, really. And a lot of the group that I knew then, not a lot of them are left here in Cincinnati. Same for me. Like the friends that I had in the very beginning when I came here, most of them are somewhere else now. Whether that's a lot of them are actually in a different country, even though some of them were Americans. But even some of my American friends like moved away. But also I was friends with a lot of exchange students or like international people. And then they moved somewhere else. And then, yeah, people from Cincinnati, a lot of them just moved within the U.S., Like, and a lot of my uh, friends from here moved to Bavaria, to Munich for some reason. I don't that's know. true. Yeah, we, that's have crazy. An, we have a, like a little Cincinnati outpost here. There's a little, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, fun for me. There's like five people from Cincinnati that I'm, I'm going to visit in Munich. That's it's crazy. so true. But I think just moving back home is always easier. Getting back yeah, to that whole logistics part. Because you know what you're getting into. You're a citizen. You don't have to deal with all that visa stuff. And you already know the area. You, ha you have your family. It's like much, oh, yeah. much easier than moving abroad. Yeah, we have a place to stay. Like we can yeah. already order furniture and other things. Say, hey, my parents, like there's, there's something going to show up on your door in the next week. Just put it in my room. I'm going to yeah. pick it up when I'm home. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved here, we moved right into the apartment without any furniture. Went to Ikea, ordered everything, had everything built together. And there we just have the time of like yeah. actually going somewhere, buying something that we want and mm -hmm. like look for an apartment. We luckily already have an apartment, but move in and do all these things. So that, that makes it way, way easier. And then there's no language barrier. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, my wife immediately found a job. She's starting on the That's 1st great. of January, which was awesome. was crazy. Coming back to like the, the culture thing and having non-Americans work. But, I mean, she's German, but she went there with like five years of work experience in the U.S. and she immediately got hired, which yeah. was mm -hmm was really nice. That's Over awesome. It's like, yeah, I, I was very surprised that it happened that easy, especially for like Lübeck being a traditional part of Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a question for you though. Um, yes. What do you think are like the, th let's say three things that you're really looking forward to about being back in Germany and three things that you think you're going to miss about the U.S.? Um, and and things, besides uh, family and friends. I, I'll, I'll take family out. I think the, the main thing I'm really looking forward to is playing soccer again. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm not playing soccer here, but on a regular, regulated basis. Tuesday, Thursday is practice. Sunday is a game. You have a league. You can get relegated. You can get a league up. It's like the system. It gives me consistency. I'm really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Then it's, it's the food. Um, when I walk to Lübeck, it's so much healthier. It's mm -hmm. so much easier to eat healthy food. I think I, I talked to you earlier. I was like, even in, in Europe, I was at the airport in Amsterdam, and I wanted to get a quick snack, and I got a fresh salmon multi-grain toast with a fresh pressed orange juice just at the next corner yeah. well here you get your fried chicken sandwiches <laughs> yeah. you definitely I can find your that. healthy you can find your healthy food here but it's not as easy as it is and then when i walked through Lübeck, there were so many like international foods but also so many vegetarian mm -hmm. vegan options like you can get a quick break uh, like bread with some cold cuts here you can get other things that that's really what i'm looking forward to the second one is definitely the food and then um the third one Uh, riding trains. Mm -hmm. I was on the train because I was in Germany. I had to go to Bielefeld, was on the train, took the train, had my laptop, could work, Wi-Fi, perfect. No hassle at all. I didn't have to drive. So that was that was really good. Yeah. yeah. And then three things I'm going to miss in the U.S. Uh, sports events, number one. Okay. I just love American sports events. I went on Wednesday, I went to the Cyclones game here in Cincinnati. Oh, yeah? Was so, it your first so Cyclones your... Was it your first Cyclones Yeah, first game. Cyclones team. So the Cyclones are second or third league ice hockey team here in the U.S.? I don't know what it is. It, it's like not yeah. Major League uh, Ice Hockey. It's not NHL. They had $1 beer nights. It yeah. was a sold-out stadium. They do that every Wednesday, I think. Yeah. 
there was yeah. a there was the national anthem and then they had some shows in between the halves or the I think it's actually thirds at ice hockey yeah. and events and all this. It was just just great to be there and I love to be in these stadiums. And like you have soccer in, in Germany, all this. Mm -hmm. But then we went to a, a football game two weeks before and they had the the military flyover, they had the all these things and fireworks and all this. It's just a whole show. Yeah. And I really enjoy going to sports events here in the US. Um the second thing is Oh, I really like that bars close at 2 a.m. here because you, you don't like go it. out. I like it too. <laughs> you don't have to. In Germany, no you, go out, you don't go out before like midnight, 1 a.m. And then your whole weekend is done. It's it's fun to yeah. go out. I like it, especially if you go out in the morning and you get breakfast and then you go home. But if you're, if I'm in bed by 2.30, I'm perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's, that's really what it is. And then um, the third thing, probably traveling in the U.S. I really enjoy traveling in the U.S. It's cheap to fly. If I want to go from here to Florida, I go from here to West Coast. It's, it's relatively cheap to fly. And there's just so much to see. Yes, yeah. there's, there's so much to see. I've seen a lot of the US, but there's still so many things I want to see. Yeah. But that's probably the, the, the top three things that I'm going to miss. But yeah, sports events, yeah, are something, a... sports events are something different here. It's yeah, for sure. So much entertainment. For sure. Even I go to sports events here sometimes, even though I really don't care about sports. Oh, yeah, in you do country. not care at all. But the event <laughs> makes it worth it. Like, I've yeah. been to a lot of college Respect football games all. here, and I Tom's don't even understand football. <laughs> even baseball, you just go there, you go there for a few innings, you eat your, your, your stadium food, you your see hot the, dogs. the excitement, the hot dogs, the, <laughs> the nuts with all the cheese on it. It's just, it's just good stuff. I, I really enjoy yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And the sense that he's perfect. Yeah, there is everything here, like all the major sports that you want. Nah. Well, Basketball, you have the college basketball. Which is right? also fun. And there's yeah. good college basketball in Cincinnati as well. Yeah. And then also UC, as of now, ranked number four. I hope it's still the same when we, when we release this podcast. A lot of excitement <laughs> in the city here. <laughs> really, did you see college game day when it was in the city? It was nuts. Yeah, so... I think I can say that now, but um, I used to live in that area, right? I like never tried to like say that. But I don't live in that area now, in the university area. But um, that was the weekend after I moved away there and I was like kind of glad that I wasn't there because I think it was insane <laughs> oh, it was, like just driving insane. getting through the area uh. I watched it on like TV and like uh, social media because everyone just like shared everything about it it was crazy I wasn't there in person though yeah I saw like Instagram stories and whatnot and it looked pretty crazy yeah yeah I had, I had a lot had, of friends had, who went I had two German colleagues here in the city mm -hmm. and I was like what is going on here it's like it's yeah. The Were whole you there? Will, Did you go? Uh, yeah, we we walked over not over campus, okay. but we walked through to that area around yeah. the, mm -hmm. the college. It was, it was a lot of fun, mm -hmm. and also I think it was homecoming weekend at the same time. Yeah, it was it both at the same up. time. Insane. We should maybe explain super quickly for everyone listening what that was. Go ahead and what explain, Nicholas, because I think day. you would understand. You I. Uh, you would understand so it better than I do. I, I, did, I, I did the game day part and you do the homecoming part. So <laughs> college game day, um, UC football is for the first time, I think, in, in the history ranked in the top four college football teams of the of the nation. And we're having a very good season. So they had the college game day, which is a TV show live from the UC campus mm -hmm. where they had famous, famous football people there doing interviews. They were doing little games. They were talking to the fans. You know, the fans show up with all their signs and jokes and everything. It was crowded. And pretty much... I mean, there's so many football games going on on the Saturday for, for college. It's hundreds of, of games. Yeah. And they like talk about all that stuff live from UC campus. And people just want to be on TV. They want to be there. They are really happy because uh, UC is undefeated. They have a really good season. They have the chance to go into the playoffs for the first time. And it was just a lot of excitement. It just all piled up at the same time. And then there was mm -hmm. homecoming, which... I'm still not 100% sure what's going on there, but Josh, you can I mean, that. homecoming, to be honest, I'm not like 100% sure where it comes from, but I mean, homecoming, the word obviously coming home is the concept of normally there's one day a year in, in the fall when all of the alumni, quote unquote, all of the alumni of a certain institution, so be it high school or college, um, come back and celebrate like the school, if you will. So like there's a homecoming day parade oftentimes, um, I would say it's no, they're normally some of the most well-attended events um, or like sporting events of a university or for like a high school. Um, so it's already a big deal. There are lots of, there's lots of pre-gaming that goes on, um, different events on the campus. Um, yeah, like that whole week usually. Like there's usually mm -hmm. a ball at UC, like yeah. um, parties and official gatherings. Um, and then the homecoming football game is usually such a big event yes. anyways. Exactly. And so coupling the two of those together. It's usually sold out and everything. 
Yeah. The two of those together, I can only imagine how insane it was. Yeah, like usually homecoming in that area means that all the streets are packed. Uh, there's bad traffic. All the parking lots are full of tailgating. And the whole campus usually has tailgating too, which means like the um, kind of gathering before a football game or a sports event in the U.S. where like you'll have things set up like um, Hüpfbogen. Was in Hüpfbogen? Of, of English. <laughs> kind of, I don't know. Um, bouncy houses. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Bounce yeah, houses. those things and like um, people grill out and have barbecues and uh, give away free beer and things like that. So it's already crazy. It's kind and of like then a you crazy add, fair. It is, yeah. And and then you add all of this game day, college game day stuff to it and the um, the count, what, what do you call it? Like the desk that the hosts were sitting at yeah. was actually set up outside um, on mm -hmm. campus. And so it wasn't like an indoor area where they could regulate who was coming in and like campus is open. There's no gates or anything around it. So it was crazy how many people were gathered around it and how big the audience was. Yeah. yeah. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be it for our conversation slash interview with Nick Blas. Uh, since he's a veteran on this this podcast now, <laughs> I feel like it's more of a conversation than an interview. Um, but thank you for taking the time and joining us again, Nick Blas. I know it was a pleasure for me to talk to you again. This I feel like this is the first time I've seen you um, in a while. Yeah, we've talked. We'll, or we'll texted, talk. We'll but, talk, but we haven't seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was great to be back on, and uh, I'll give another update in a year how, how life has been in Germany. <laughs> He'll tell us that you're moving maybe, back to maybe the US. earlier. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm moving somewhere completely different. But China. no, it was great to be on. And, and Josh, I'll see you probably in a few months. And yes. Fili, I'll see you in the next Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yeah, and Nicholas, you're going I'm still waiting party. on my, my invitation for this goodbye party. I never received it. I mean, <laughs> Would you have flown in, Josh? <laughs> no. But the invitation is still nice. Yeah, you just want to feel invited. That's exactly. That's all you really want. <laughs> but no, it was it was great to be on. Um, yeah, yeah if, if people have questions in the comments, just just leave them there. We'll answer them next time. Or if there's something really, yeah, really, are you gonna really be urgent? I'll come on for an emergency press conference. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Maybe are you gonna be reading the comments again, like last time? I'll read the comments. You know, I update them Perfect. every hour, and then get mad awesome. about it. <laughs> you not, get mad about <laughs> it? <laughs> no, I, I say I will get mad if someone is not nice to me. Ah, okay. So be nice, Probably, everyone. Yeah, I might have like explain wrong what a hearing is and the mud <laughs> and all these things so we'll have to do really a people. we'll have to do an instagram live with you maybe sometime that you can then correct yeah. yourself on the things that people uh, <laughs> i can defend i can defend, you can myself defend yourself there. live <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks everyone for watching and listening um obviously the common thing that we just talked about would be taking place on youtube so if you're currently listening on apple Podcasts or spotify you're gonna have to head over to youtube and leave your comment there so that nicholas can see it um the link is in the show notes down below and of course as you know you can can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can give us a thumbs up, all these cool things. You can send us an email. I'm actually not going to say everything this time because I feel like the people know by <laughs> they know now. now. It's been a year. They know. It's been a year. But you can send us an email. Um, you can find everything down below anyways. You can follow us on Instagram at Understanding Train Station. You can support us on Patreon. You can support us via buymeacoffee.com, buy us a drink. Um, we really appreciate it um, because, yeah, it's been over a year with this podcast yes. and we're still going strong which is awesome yes. uh, feel very thankful for that I was actually saying that yesterday on Thanksgiving because as we said today when we're recording mm -hmm. is Black Friday I was thinking yeah I'm actually really thankful that we get to do this podcast and people are actually listening yeah. and enjoy it and we just get to talk about our lives basically <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thank you guys for uh, listening and for watching and you will hear and see us again in two weeks on Thursday and danke Niklas one more time danke Niklas Ciao. ciao Tschüss. Tschüssi. <laughs> Tschüssi. Tschüssi. Oh. All right.